All right, everyone. I'm going to call council to order at 4.39 p.m. Today, oh, that is right. Today is Wednesday, December 1st, 2021. Um, and we'll begin with the territorial acknowledgement. <clears throat> And I want to acknowledge that I'm hosting this meeting um, from the traditional unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, which includes the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Kukutlam, and Katsi nations. I want to recognize that this meeting is being held virtually. And so this means that the lands in which I'm calling in from uh, and chairing this meeting from today are not necessarily the same lands uh, by which some of you may be calling in from today. So I want to urge everyone to, if you don't already know, um, you know, do your own research on your own time about what lands <clears throat> you're currently situated on and, and the nations to which um, this land belongs and, and the stewards of these lands and recognizing what our roles um, as settlers are in terms of standing in solidarity with Indigenous communities um, in every capacity that we can, whether it be uh, as a counselor, as an executive, as a as a as a as a human in this society, um, what can we do, um, and what is our role in that? So we'll start off with the roll call of attendance, as per usual. Um, I'm going to uh, call on you by your position, and if you can please state your name, your pronouns, and access needs, that would be great. And please be ready to unmute yourself when your name's next on the agenda, just so we can move through the roll calls as, as expeditiously as possible. And so we'll begin with the representative for archaeology. Hi, sorry. Uh, my name is Damon. My pronouns are he and him. My accessibility needs are met. Thank you. Uh, Bachelor of Environment. I think it's Tiana. I think she said she'd be a little bit late. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. She sent me an email. I, I CC'd you. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, behavioral yeah, she's neuroscience. Just she's just popping in now. So. Oh. Okay. Come back to her, her if you want. Bachelor of Environment. Did you? We're just doing roll call. Hi, I'm Tiana. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and all my access needs are met. Thank you. Thank you. Behavioral neuroscience. Biology, BPK. Hi, my name is Kashish. My pronouns are she, her, hers. All my access needs are met, except I'll just have to be leaving at eight today. Chemistry. Uh, in the chat here. Hello, everyone. My name is Gwen. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and all my access needs are met. It will probably be better if I type into the chat instead of speaking up since it's really noisy here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, cognitive science. Communications. Criminology. Hi, Charlotte, she, her pronouns, and my access needs are met. Thank you. Data science. Or um, economics. Hi, everyone. My name is Mandir Kumar. Um, pronouns are he, him, his, and all my access needs are met. Thank you. Education. Engineering science. Hi, my name is Sarah. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and all my access needs are met. English. Hi, my name is Liz. My pronouns are she, they, and all of my access needs are met. Environmental science. Hi, my name is Chloe. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and all my access needs are met. Film Student Union. French. Hi, my name's Kylie, pronouns she, her, and all of my access needs have been met. However, I might have to step out to take a 10 minute phone call with my doctor's office. I will put in chat when I leave and when I return if I do have to. Thank you. Not a problem, thank you. Uh, gender, sexuality, and women's studies. Hi, can everyone hear me? Perfectly. Okay, 
Awesome. Thank you. Hi, my name's Devin. She, her, hers pronouns, and my access needs are met. Thanks. Geography. Hello, my name is Natasha. She, they pronouns. Uh, all my ask, ask, access needs are met. Sorry. It's <laughs> all good. Thank you. Global Asia Studies. Health science. Hi everyone, my name is Joselle, she, her pronouns, and all my access needs are met. I'll just have to leave exactly at 8.30 if the meeting is extended. No worries. History. IAP. Hello, my name is Jeremy Felix, he, he they pronouns, and all my accessibility needs are met. Thank you. Uh, ISSA. International Studies Student Association. Labor Studies. My name is Justin Chen. The pronouns are he, they, they, and all my access needs are met. Linguistics. Hi, I'm Olive. My pronouns are she, her. All my access needs are met. Math. Hi, I'm Ben. My pronouns are he, him, his, and all my access needs are met. Megatronic System Engineering. MBB. Hi, I'm Afneet. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and all my access needs are met. Operations research. Hi, my name is Ash. Pronouns are he and his. All my access needs have been met. Philosophy. Hi, my name is Tony. He, him, his pronouns, and all my access needs are met. Physics. Hi, my name is Graham Rich. Pronouns he, him, his, and all my access needs are met. Political science. Hi, my name is Abby. He, him, his pronouns, and all my access needs are met. Psychology. Hi, everyone. My name is Tiffany Liu. My pronouns are she, they, and all my access needs are met. Thank you. Science Undergrad Society. Hello, everyone. My name is Zaid Lari. My pronouns are he, him, his, and my accessibility needs are currently met. Society of Arts and Social Sciences. Hi everyone, my name is Judith. I go by she, her pronouns, and I am filling in for ACOM today. All my access needs are met. Thank you. Thanks for being here, Judith. Sociology and anthropology. Hi, I am Kayla, pronouns she, her, hers, and all my access needs are met. Software systems. Hello, hello, my name is Shashank Tanalapati. My pronouns are he, him, his. All my accessibility needs are met. In except that I have to step up for an exam at 5.30. I'll be gone for around 90 minutes. I'll be back. Thank you. Oh, good luck. Um, statistics? Uh, in the chat, hi, my name is Gia. And pronouns are he, her, hers. All my axes are met, but I can't speak here, so I'll be better to type. Thank you. Um, sustainable Energy Engineering Student Society. Theater Student Union. My name is Claire. I'm the alternate for Samantha Walters. Any pronouns and all my access needs are met. Thank you. Um, world literature. Uh, First Nations Métis and Inuit Student Association. International Student Advocates. Students of Caribbean and African Ancestry. Women's Center. Nim hasn't completed her onboarding, so she will be joining us in uh, January to start her journey. Okay, thanks, Devin. Um, Student Athlete Advisory Committee. Hi, everyone. My name is Paul. Pronouns he, him, his. All my accessibility needs are met. However, I will have to step out at 7.30 for a final group project. Thank you. No worries. Thank you. Uh, President. Hi, everyone. My name is Gabriel Leosis. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his. And 
My axis needs are met other than for some odd reason today, I'm experiencing incredible dry mouth. So <laughs> I'm going to have trouble talking at certain points, but uh, I should be fine. I have my water bottle here. Um, VP internal and organizational development. My name is Corbett, pronouns are he, him, his, and access needs are met. Thank you. Thanks, Corbett. VP Finance and Services. Uh, in the chat, Amos Pangura, VP Finance and Services, all access needs are met. Um, VP University and Academic Affairs is on a leave of absence. Um, VP External and Community Affairs. Hi, it's Matt. My pronouns are he, him, his. My accessibility needs, I'm on my phone. Um, I'm only going to be able to speak when needed until I go home, but I'm actually out and I need to be somewhere. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Matt. Uh, VP Equity uh, sent in their regrets. And the VP Events and Student Affairs is on a leave of absence. Society staff, um, operations organizer. Hi everyone, my name is Aisha. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and my access needs are met. And also, um, I'm so sorry, Olive, for butchering the spelling of your name. Don't worry, it happens all the time. Thanks, Aisha. A board organizer. Oh, no, Elle is not coming tonight. Um, campaigns, research and policy coordinator. Hi everyone, my name is BT, pronoun she, her, has, my access needs are met, yep. Thank you. Administrative assistant. Hi, my name is Christina, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and all my access needs are met. Fantastic. All right, well this brings us then to item number four, section number four of our agenda, which is the consent agenda. And we're at 4.1, uh, the motion uh, reads, be it resolved to adopt the consent agenda by unanimous consent. And we have two motions under the consent agenda today for consideration. We have 4.1.1, matters arising from the minutes from the, uh, the November 24th council meeting. And 4.1.2, matters arising from the minutes from, the, from committees, namely the executive committee on November 15th. 2021. Are there any objections to these two motions under the consent agenda today? Seeing no objections, we consider we can consider the consent agenda approved unanimously, which takes us to section five, adoption of the agenda. And I'll read um, motion 5.1 now, be it resolved to adopt the agenda as presented. Uh, do I have a mover? Corbett moves. Corbett moves. Is there a second? Shashank. Signs. Shashank seconds. Thank you. All right. We have um, an agenda that's been circulated. Um, are there any questions, comments, or amendments to be put forward for today's agenda? Corbett on cue. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Um, just a quick heads up. Like, there's been a lot of last minute additions and mostly adding items uh, that are already from motions and that are exist like attachments but I need to um, I'd like to add two technically it could be one discussion I, I think I'll be just two um, for one titled Red Bull proposal sub gaming lounge and another one titled memory express proposal sub gaming lounge um, as also I need to amend the two notes of motions um, and I'll separate them. I've already sent like uh, the doc to it to staff, but I'll break it up in the um, in chat here for everyone. It's ba it's the reason why they're amended is is mostly for clarity based on feedback from uh, our lawyer. Um, but that the the, per the main purpose of the motion is still the same. Um, so oops. So give me a minute. Actually, you know what? I'm just going to attach the uh, the document because I think it'll be easier. Yeah, so that's been sent to everyone. Um, uh, so that's for the notice of motion 10.1 and 10.2 for both. And 
Okay. They're, they're specifically titled off in each uh, document or in the document. So it's easy to tell which one's for which. Okay. And just to clarify what you're doing, Corbett, there's there's different, you've changed the wording of the motions. And so the correct wording is in this document. Yes. Okay. So I'll need to open that so that I have it for later. I'm gonna make a note on my agenda that the wording was changed. Corbett, was there anything else? Not that I know of. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little unsure just because there's been a lot of stuff that came in late last night and earlier this morning. So um, I'm just clarifying, it was, you're just swapping out, you're changing the wording for the notices of motion and that's it? Or that's was... it, and then they added the two added uh, then uh, discussion items. Which were? Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, sorry, bring back the page. Um, Actually, yeah, so Red Bull proposal for the sub gaming lounge. And then the second one is memory express proposal for the sub gaming lounge. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, thanks Corbett. Was there any other questions, comments, or amendments as it pertains to the agenda? All right, I'm seeing none. So seeing as you put forward all the amendments today, Corbett, did you wanna move that? Yes, please. All right, so Corbett is moving to add those amendments, add those items to today's agenda as an amendment. Do I have a second? Political science. I, uh, math seconds. Um, we'll put this to a vote. All those in favor of the amendments that Corbett put forward, which I'll just clarify again what they were. They were two discussion items, Red Bull proposal and Memory Express proposal and then just amending the wording for the notices and motions that were added that already are on the agenda, um, but there's some amendments that were made and so the wording is just being changed. <clears throat> um, we'll put that to a vote. All those in favor of this amendment seeking unanimous consent. Um, if you'd like to vote against or abstain, please raise your hand via the Zoom raise hand feature and we'll move to a roll call vote if that is the case. Uh, if not, I'm going to consider um, this carried unanimously if there are no objections. All right, so this is carried unanimously, seeing no objections. This means we are um, back to the main motion, which at this point reads, be resolved to adopt the agenda as amended. Are there any last questions, comments, or concerns with today's agenda? Seeing none, we'll put this to a vote as well. All those in favor of the main motion seeking unanimous consent, please raise your hand if you would like to vote against or abstain. This is carried unanimously as well. And so this means we'll move right into section six of the agenda presentations. And the first of which is 6.1 Storm Hacks 2022 grant request. And so, um, are these folks present on the on the Zoom call? Yes. Fantastic. The, the floor is your guys' whenever you're ready. Cool, thank you. Uh, would it be okay if we sh uh, shared our slides? Yeah, go ahead. You should have the cool. ability to do that. Okay, awesome. Okay, thank you so much for your time to hear our proposal regarding Stormhacks 2022. My name is Pranir and I'm the current president of SFU Surge. My personal pronouns are he, him, and his. Before we begin, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that I'm located on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Tsleil-Waututh, uh, Coquitlam, Squamish, and Musqueam nations. Uh, 
So at Surge, our mission is to empower students interested in a career in technology through events, projects, and networking. Stormhacks furthers our mission by combining these aspects into one large scale event over the course of a weekend. Stormhacks 2022 will be SFU's largest hackathon. It will take place virtually from February 18th to the 20th over a span of 48 hours. For context, a hackathon is an invention marathon where people collaborate in teams to build a project from scratch, such as mobile or web applications. The project themes for our hackathon are education, mental health, and accessibility. So why host a hackathon? Stormhacks offers three main benefits for students and SFU itself. Firstly, hackathons encourage students from all disciplines to be innovative and solve real world problems. At Stormhacks 2021, we had students studying computer science, design, business, health science, and more. Secondly, hackathons are a great way for students to learn new skills, build meaningful connections, and leave with a portfolio ready project. During the event, students will also receive mentorship and feedback from industry professionals. Lastly, Stormhacks contributes to SFU as a community engaged campus by building connections with alumni and external organizations. Stormhacks 2022 is a second hackathon we're organizing. Earlier this year in February, we organized Stormhacks 2021, which was a huge success. The event brought together 600 applicants and 300 hackers, of which 70% attended SFU, 38% were female, and 45% were first time hackers. We had 45 SFU alumni uh, that joined as either judges or mentors, and we had 20 sponsors, including the SFSS, contributing $15,000. The success of Stormhacks 2021 demonstrates a high demand for hackathons within the SFU community. We want to make hackathons uh, stable in the community. So we're planning to make Stormhacks 2022 a larger, more engaged hackathon based on the feedback we collected from Stormhacks 2021. Participants wanted more time for hacking, so we're doubling the hacking time. Instead of using multiple platforms, we'll be using an all-in-one event platform for workshops, contests, and judging, and we'll be presenting more contests and prizes to, uh, to enhance engagement. We also aim to support diversity and inclusion within tech, and we'll make the event beginner-friendly by hosting a series of workshops leading up to the hackathon and providing participants with resources and mentor support throughout the weekend. Uh, we'll also reach out to constituency groups of the council to encourage students from marginalized communities to participate. So we'll be going through the event budget now. Uh, if you'd like to follow along, please turn to section five of our proposal if you do have it. Um, to provide an overview of the budget for Stormhacks 2022, the total event cost is $30,495. Our goal is to generate over $10,000 in external funding outside of the SFSS. And this proposal requests for $20,000 from the SFSS to support Stormhacks 2022. We'll be going through each aspect of the budget for our event, but we'll start with a higher level breakdown. So $5,555 will be used for a virtual event platform, $6,545 for merchandise and shipping, $8,250 for prizes, $6,200 for food vouchers, and $3,716 for contingency, which makes up 15% uh, of our total budget. We chose to host the hackathon virtually due to the uncertainty of the pandemic and the high cost to rent a physical venue. The most economically viable option we found was the SFU gyms, which cost $14,060. By hosting Stormhacks virtually, we saved $7,000. In Stormhacks 2021, we used Discord and Zoom. Um, unfortunately, using multiple platforms caused some confusion among participants and judges. So to streamline all aspects of the event, we'll host a hackathon on Socio, an all-in-one virtual event platform. We did investigate several platforms and decided on Socio as it includes accessibility features. This is discussed in detail in section 5.3.2 of our proposal. To lower food costs, food vouchers will only be provided to SFU students and mentors who check in during the event. The $20 voucher is only valid during the event, which comes down to $5 a meal. We provided Uber Eats vouchers to SFU participants in Stormhacks 2021, working alongside the SFSS, so we're pretty familiar with the logistics. We've allocated $8,250 for prizes to incentivize participation and quality project submissions. Prizes constitute the largest allocation of our budget since project submissions are optional, and we want to encourage and motivate students to showcase their work, making the most of their experience. To make Stormhacks more inclusive, we plan to offer a diverse range of prizes, uh, uh, prize categories such as Best Beginner Project, Women in Tech Award, and Best UI UX Design. Merchandise is another customary component of hackathons and is expected from sponsors to promote their brand. We plan to distribute t-shirts and masks as these items are very practical and reusable. 
Although merch is a significant proportion of the budget, a fourth of that cost is due to shipping and packaging, as we'd have to ship out uh, merch to each participant individually. To lower shipping costs, however, we'll only be shipping merch out to participants who are located in Canada at the time of the event, present their project to judges, and are unable to pick up their merch from the SFU Burnaby campus. By introducing these requirements, we would save um, $1,760 in shipping. Please refer to section 5.3.5 of the proposal uh, for further details on merchandise and shipping. External sponsors such as Amazon and Fraser Health have already expressed their interest in our event solely based on the success of Stormhacks 2021. Therefore, we believe our goal of raising $10,000 through sponsorship outside of the SFSS is achievable. Uh, please refer to section 4.5 of our proposal for a list of potential sponsors we are reaching out to. We're also planning to register Stormhacks as a major league uh, hacking member event. Since MLH is the official student hacking uh, hackathon league, being recognized as an MLH member ev event designates Stormhacks as a globally renowned hackathon. One of the requirements for an MLH member event is for the event to be free for all participants to make it accessible to everyone. Thank you so much for your time. We hope that that gives you a good overview of Stormhacks. Um, please refer to the proposal for our detailed event plan um, and let us know if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the, oh, wait, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. sorry. I thought my microphone was doing something whack. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, that was great. Um, does anyone have any questions, members of council? Devin, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's just, I guess, a clarifying question. So you said 70% of uh, students were SFU students, meaning that there were 30 who weren't SFU students. Is there like an age range uh, for this or do they have to be university students of a different university or is this something anyone can join with any skill level? Just looking for clarification of who's included. Sorry, I was muted. Um, for our hackathon in, uh, when we did it in February 2021, um, our requirements were that uh, students would have to be enrolled in university at the time they apply. So this would be undergrads and graduates. But um, I think almost over 95%, I would say, were undergrad students. Thank you. No worries. Zaid? Um, I didn't quite catch. When is this going to be held? It will be, uh, so we plan to host it on February 18th to the 20th. So it's a 48 hour event. Um, we decided on 48 hours because uh, uh, in February 2021, we, when we hosted Stormhacks, it was only 24 hours, uh, which was which is kind of customary, uh, but we heard a lot of feedback, especially through the virtual environment that uh, folks wanted a little bit more time to prep their projects. Um, and that's why we thought 48 hours would be better off. Uh, it's also what sponsors, external sponsors have recommended to us. Any other questions? Corbett. Yeah, um, is uh, just for people's clarity, I've given back and forth with Premier and, and Ali for question and answer and lead up to this grant presentation. Um, so some other questions I wanted to ask and maybe I missed it was, uh, is there any additional supports you need from the SLS that's not necessarily listed in the presentation or if you wanna flesh out on? Like last year, for instance, last year we helped them with like an Uber Eats account and stuff, or either we, the SOS created an Uber Eats account to support um, last year's storm hacks, which then allow us to provide the same level of service supports to other groups during the pandemic. Yeah, so um, we are planning to go through with the Uber Eats vouchers uh, this uh, for next year, I would say, uh, for 2022 as well. Um, for additional support, we'd love to have the SFSS, like, you know, if, if you have anything that you'd like to support the hackathon with, we'd be more than happy to welcome that. Um, I know that last year we also had the SFSS, um, if uh, uh, you guys presented a video um, at the beginning at our opening ceremonies, uh, but um, if there's a way that you can participate um, in the event through workshops or any presentations that you'd like to make, we'd be open for those opportunities as well. 
Uh, also to add on a little bit, um, my name is Ali and I'm the head of finances for Surge. Um, to add on logistically wise for um, support from the SFSS, obviously we need you guys to help us with contract signings as well as any um, sponsorship signings. So all of our sponsorships are tentative because we know we have to wait for approval from the SFSS before we fully commit to sponsorships. Absolutely. Yeah, Devin, go ahead again. Yeah, sorry for all the questions. Uh, I guess my uh, second question, and uh, correct me if I misheard, but last we gave fifteen thousand dollars for the last hackathon, and this year there's asking you guys are asking for twenty thousand. I'm just wondering. I know that you want to. I know there's a detailed budget, but where is that five thousand dollars? Are you just expecting more people to come to this hackathon? Was there not enough money last time? What's the difference in budget from last hackathon to this upcoming one? Yeah, definitely. So. We're definitely expecting um, a lot more people. We, we're trying to make the event larger and we're trying to increase our price pool so that we can offer um, a more diverse range of price categories um, just to be more inclusive with um, with uh, folks from all different backgrounds and fields of study. Um, but the main increase of prizes is definitely due to the increase in uh, people coming over. We've tried to limit um, that increase by uh, putting in certain requirements that would boost engagement and lower costs. For example, for uh, for merchandise or for all these kind of extra goods that we're trying to give out, um, students have to present their projects. They have to be based in Canada so that we can ship to them easier. Um, um, and even for the food vouchers, we're limiting that to SFU students. So we've been trying to limit some um, options that like we're giving out to limit costs, but also to try to boost engagement. That makes sense. Thank you. Warren? Um, hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say that I'm in favor of this motion. Um, this, like, the Stormhack Hackathon is one of the, the major events that, <clears throat> and, like, not until, like, recently it happened, is hopefully it's going to happen annually. It's one of the rare things that puts SFU on the map. It's uh, something that I know a lot of computer science software, uh, software uh, so, what's, so C, I forgot what it stands for, or data science students are looking for every, sorry, <laughs> so C people, but all the like basically like CS related fields are always like looking forward to like a hackathon and having one hosted by our own university being so uh, like Emily approved and uh, just it's it's like a big event and i hope everyone's going to be in favor yeah thanks for could, could i just add on to the budget increase i forgot to mention so just in terms of specifics um last year our hackathon we accepted 300 students to participate in the event and that was only due to budget limitations because we had over 600 applicants so we actually had to deny 300 students seats for our hackathon this year, with the increased budget, we're hoping to get at least 400 students. Um, um, but just wanted to clarify that because we do get a lot more applicants, um, especially being registered as an MLH event. The event is marketed in a global scale. Um, although we do prioritize SFU students, um, we still have a huge number of students that we're not able to provide seats for. And that's the, that's the increase in budget, uh, especially with the 5K. Thank you. Um, Shashank? Yeah, thanks. I uh, just wanted to add on, uh, first thing is my support for this entire event. It's one of the things that SFU does, which is pretty big. And my question here is, so this event is basically termed as a hackathon and your themes are very diverse. You have uh, things for, I, I don't really remember, but they're not just specifically computing science themes or software systems themes. How are you planning on advertising to non-computing science or non-faculty uh, of applied science members for them to come and attend a hackathon? Because if I go and ask a, let's say, for example, a history student or a psychology student to come and attend the hackathon with me, that's a selling point. I just wanted to know what your plan is. Oh. I'm muted again, <laughs> for sure. So yeah, uh, like you said, we, we have introduced global themes. Uh, so our, our three themes are mental health, uh, accessibility, um, and 
it was, sorry, mental health, accessibility, and education. <laughs> um, and so by introducing global themes, um, we, we want to break down that, uh, that traditional barrier that like hackathons are meant for more um, applied science and uh, computer science engineering students uh, by introducing these global themes because to create solutions and projects to um, you know address these themes, it does take a multidisciplinary approach. Um, it, it, it takes a lot of research um, and, and the projects, they may be developed through tech, they may be developed through other platforms. Like we've seen a lot more design um, projects come out of hackathons as well. Um, so there's a lot of creative ways that you can develop projects to build meaningful solutions. But to build those meaningful solutions, um, I think it does require that interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary approach. Um, also, uh, to support students that are new to hackathons or may not have the, the, the technical knowledge, we're supporting the, the week before the hackathon, we're throwing um, uh, just a week of workshops to help students get prepared for the hackathon. Uh, uh, we introduce some technologies that they can use, they can try to use, and we also discuss strategies um, with how they should approach a hackathon in order to make the most um, out of their experience. Love it, thank you. Zaid? Um, sorry, there's a garbage disposal thing going on outside, but um, so you said that you have, wow, it's pretty loud. Um, so you said that you have an excess of applicants. So I was kind of wondering what is your selection process and do you have a set cap for non-SFU students? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, we use something, uh, we, we use a tool called TypeScript um, for applications. Um, and so what we try to do is uh, in the application, we're looking for students that um, um, express high um, motivation and enthusiasm about the event. So we have a couple of questions regarding uh, their university, just so that we can firstly prioritize seats to SFU students. Um, usually we're looking at um, two thirds or, uh, oh, sorry, it's called Typeform, not TypeScript. TypeScript is a language, my bad on that. Um, um, but we're looking at a ratio of two thirds or four fifths, uh, but we do definitely try to prioritize SFU students. Um, um, and then through Typeform, we're also trying to increase uh, diversity. Um, we want to make the event more inclusive, um, and so through the through the events, the the most like the main thing that we look at is their long answer questions. Um, that's where we judge how motivated they are for the event, how maybe excited or willing uh, to create the project they are. Because with hackathons, the main thing that we want to see is projects come out of it. That's what sponsors and external organizations want to see. Um, through hackathons, um, there's a lot of career opportunities that open up too. Um, and, and for students to access those opportunities, you really need creation of projects to rise from hackathons. That's why we target um, those that show a lot of enthusiasm about creating a project um, through the application process. Uchi? Um, maybe I missed this in the presentation, but I just want, I'm just curious, um, what are you planning to encourage like students from the marginalized communities to like participate in this um, in this storm hike? Yeah, for sure. Um, so the first thing that we're trying to do is we're trying to um, have specific marketing effects, uh, uh, marketing strategies towards the marginalized groups. So we're, we're hoping to reach out to the constituency groups um, um, uh, at, the, at the council um, to try to work with them to reach out to other groups that we can uh, we, we can advertise our hackathon to to encourage students from marginalized communities to participate. Shoshank. Hey, uh, just a teensy weensy suggestion. Um, so just to add on to uh, my question from earlier about multiple disciplines participating in the hackathon, if I'm just looking at this from a regular uh, fast student's perspective. If I were to go to hackathon, I'd gather four of my other friends who are the best in coding that I know and go to the hackathon. Now, I know this is very uh, stereotypical and this is how every computing science student thinks, sorry to everyone that are the computing science in this call, but I would recommend if along with the workshops, you could have a sort of uh, 
meet and greet session for students from different disciplines because I feel like the best way that somebody's going to ex excel in this hackathon specifically is to be good at one coding to understand the themes if something like that could be implemented. For sure. So that's actually included in the socio virtual event platform. So last time we tried to do that through Discord and it was just a little bit messy because the judging and the workshops had to be conducted through Zoom. So there was a lot of platforms that you'd have to go out, like we would operationally had, had to manage. Um, but through Socio, we can actually create rooms and we can create like project booths for people to move around. We're trying to make it as interactive and as like a feel of in-person hackathons, even though it is virtual um, as, as possible. Um, for your suggestion too, definitely we'll, we'll do that. We're trying to uh, have people meet with others, um, trying to promote that uh, interdisciplinary approach. Um, for judging uh, projects, we also have um, judges from a diverse range. So it's not just all technical um, um, experienced judges. Um, judges have a diverse range. And so through our judging process, we're also trying to you know um, look into um, a project's not just based on their tech, but based on what other things they have to offer. That's fantastic. Uh, just one more teen, uh, small question. This is uh, pertaining to the students that you actually permitted to participate. So for example, if I'm from a different university, I told like four other students in my class that we should sign up for this. Are, is the submission for the form as a group or is it as an individual student? Uh, the submission for the form is done on an individual basis, so it'll be if all of them get in and then they can group up once they're into the event. Um, but just to track back a little bit, um, we've seen like one of the things that we're really proud of is that we are a hackathon created by um, hackers. We all love going to hackathons, mm -hmm. and so we bring a lot of that with us. So especially for finding teams, um, we know all of the logistics. We we know what was missing in other hackathons, and we're going to include those in our events. And also, um, speaking as someone from computer science, some of the best hackathon experiences I've seen is experiences where I wasn't on a team of five coders, right? Some of the best experience I've seen is with a business student or with a IATSU student, right? So the bringing in interdisciplinary students, while it may not come to some computer science students, those who do choose to bring them along. Um, they actually have a really good time. And so do those people from the other disciplines. They actually enjoy themselves as well. So we really are confident that by creating a beginner-friendly environment, that's usually the thing that scares off other disciplines. We, we think that by creating that beginner-friendly environment, we really um, push forward that agenda that we want everyone to come to the event. Fantastic, thank you. And just one more thing to add on to that, um, regarding forming teams. So some people do come, um, maybe they don't have a team already. Um, for example, for our first event, Storm Hacks 2021, we had a facilitated team formation period um, before the hacking started. And we actually facilitated this session as well to ensure that people um, did form teams. And most of the time, these teams are very um, cross-disciplinary as well. And we did have some winning projects come out of those team formation teams. Sweet. Fantastic. Well, um, thank you for your presentation again and, and to council for all the questions. We are voting on um, the grants in a couple of items, um, agenda items. So you're more than welcome to stick around, turn your cameras off, go get a cup of coffee or something. Um, and thanks again. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you all for your time. Okay, we have another um, grant request presentation from uh, the Science Undergrad Society Spring Frosh. Um, so if you folks are ready to go, um, the floor is yours, yours. The floor is yours whenever you are ready. Cool. Uh, I can share my screen, right? It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Cool. Um, give me like one sec here. Uh... Can you guys see that? Uh, yeah. I can see it. Okay, cool. Um, 
Well, let me introduce, start by introducing myself. My name is Sharik. My pronouns are he, him, his. And um, I am the current president of uh, the Science Undergrad Society. And today I'm going to be talking you through our hopeful event for Science Frosh 2021 slash 2020. Because, yeah. Um, so let me start by kind of explaining. Well, oh, sorry. Some technical issues. What is Frosh for starters? Well, Frosh is an annual event that the Science Undergraduate Society has been putting on for about eight to nine years now. We do this for our first year students every year. And um, this is their first chance to interact with their peers, interact with professors, meet older students, get advice on some things. Typically this event is supposed to happen in September. However, due to the uncertainty around the COVID-19 pandemic and the return, we uh, and the executive committee at SUS didn't feel safe to put on an event like this then because there was still a lot of uncertainty around things. So instead, what we decided to do was to put on an online event, which we called SUS's Declassified School Survival Guide. That served as a, uh, for those of you that know, that's akin to Ned's Declassified School Survival Guide, if uh, any of you have watched that show. Um, but we decided to do that as the alternative and to do it completely virtually. And in that event, we just gave the opportunity to all of our DSUs that fit under such a Sussex constituency to come and to speak to this. So in this, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry. Um, so in the, the event, we um, gave the chance to our DSUs to speak to it and they got to introduce, uh, they got to draft up their own events and they got to present uh, sort of what they do in the events they're gonna be putting on in the upcoming term. Um, However, that event is not a satisfactory um, replacement for an in-person frosh. An in-person frosh that we do is typically meant to be 24 hours. It's, um, it's not akin to say doing a week of frosh, it's a day of frosh. This typically starts on Saturday morning and it goes till Sunday morning. And this year, um, because in 2020, the team, previous team wasn't able to hold a frosh, we have decided to open up the event for two years worth of students to make sure that those students who started the who started their university lives online aren't missing out on such a great opportunity like Frosh. And hopefully by opening this up for two years worth of students, they'll get to have uh, further social interaction and mingle with people outside of their years. And they can share their experiences that they've had to switching to online learning or starting an online learning and can share the experiences they've had. So a question might be, well, why do we need Frosh? Why, why do we put this event on and why does SUS um, make this one of our annual events. And over the last four or three, four months since we've held our declassified event, first years have been coming up to me a lot in the hallways and they've been telling me about how much they're enjoying their university life and how much they're enjoying being back in person. But they always tell me they haven't had that social interaction or that uh, interaction of going out to events, you know, when you're just out there on a Friday with a bunch of your friends and you want to go out to an event or you want to hang out and you want to meet new people. And Things like that have been limited since we've returned to the um, in since we've returned to in person, and hopefully moving forward, you know, we can start to put on more events like this. So these first years who um, haven't had these social interactions and have been sort of ro robbed of you know meeting new people and stuff can come through and interact with each other and sort of build those connections that are long lasting. Speaking from personal experience, I remember my first frosh and many of the people I met in that frosh, I still know five years later and are still some of my closest friends and such. So it definitely helped me moving forward. It helped them and we're still, you know, to this day. So now, as you can clearly see, uh, we have a lot of people who come out to our frosh event. Our volunteers always love it because it's a chance for our older students to come out and interact with the younger students and they have uh, good experiences from this event and they like to come out and they like to give back to the community as such as well. Now, just because we're asking for stuff, it doesn't mean the SFSS shouldn't get anything out of this. So there's two things that I think the SFSS gets out of um, supporting this event. Number one being your logo on the back of our t-shirts. Frosh t-shirts, in my opinion, are some of the most special things you can get out of the day. I think I still have like five years worth of Frosh shirts that I still pull around sometimes. And I, I love all my Frosh t-shirts and the cool designs and the themes that they do. So uh, along with other sponsors that we may potentially have this year, including like the Faculty of Science and such, you guys will get to go on the back of the shirts. And it's really important that these students know that it's the SFSS that is allowing an event like this to happen. And it's our student leaders that are, you know, putting forward this money to help out groups on campus to help them with their mental health and such. And the other thing that I would open this up to is I would love to have um, an exec 
and a non-executive counselor come out and speak about the SFSS and the things that you do for our clubs, for our DSUs, for our constituency groups, and to kind of just explain more so st more students can look to get involved, not only at the DSU level, but potentially at the FSU level. So that is definitely something that I would like to have. And if anyone is interested, they can definitely feel free to reach out to me. As you can see, some of the classic things we do, we always get a lot of Red Bull. Uh, Red Bull doesn't actually have a sponsorship with us, but they, they've been, uh, you know, giving out a lot of Red Bull to us for these events. They give out about 300 to 400 cans of Red Bull for our Froshies because they've recognized this point. We've had, we have a good working relationship with them. I actually got to go down to the Red Bull offices the other week and they showed me around and I had a good time with it. So our communication with them is strong. And as you can see, we have a capture the uh, lubed watermelon event where we sort of put the watermelon in Vaseline and it's kind of like a capture the flag thing. It's a lot of fun. Obviously this year we won't be able to do that due to COVID protocols and such, but okay. COVID-19 safety plan. So besides um, this, the standard of making sure there's a mask mandate in place, making sure that we have hand sanitizer, disposable gloves for food and whatnot, we will be using images theater as the hub. Over the reason we waited to hold, put this off to January is because there was a 25 person limit on events and now it has been increased to 50%. And Images Theater will serve as a large enough hub for the Froshies and for the volunteers to um, store their stuff and to be socially distanced and such. We'll be checking for proof of vaccination. So vaccine cards will be required. There are a few things we check for, vaccine card being one of them. We also draft up waiver forms to make sure that if anything happens during the event, they, the uh, Froshies know what they're getting themselves into. Fingers crossed, you know, nothing goes bad, but it's just a liability perspective. We'll be doing contact tracing for the entire event. And I've already submitted the forms to the student center, uh, the contact tracing and the event guidelines form for that. And we'll be booking rooms to separate groups and maintain social distancing as well. So um, throughout the day, there will be different activities and to make sure that we're not clustering and to make sure that we're not getting people in large uh, to have them in like large in, in close spaces together. We'll be separating the groups off. So we'll be doing multiple bookings throughout the day. And finally, all of our volunteers will undergo mandatory training to be informed of COVID guidelines. So the week before the event actually happens, we get all of our volunteers together and we have a dry run of the event. So they kind of get to be froshies again, which I think is pretty cool because they get to kind of go through all the events. And they get to sort of have fun with each other as well. But then at the same time, they have their training packages, which in this year will uh, tell them about the COVID guidelines in place, the safety regulations. Um, they'll be given my contact information for the day as well in case any emergencies and such arise. As as well as the information of security. Now, I thought I'd kind of walk through some of the events that we're planning for the day, starting with our opening ceremony. So this is typically where we have our DSU reps come out and they speak about their individual DSUs. I know a bunch of counselors have, uh, when I go in around to the DSU meetings earlier in the semester have expressed interest in coming out and advertising for themselves. And I would offer the same thing to the SFSS. If you guys would like to come out and speak, I'd be more than happy to have you. Um, we have a scavenger hunt section in which we basically get the Froshies to go off in groups of five or six people. We give them a list of 40 pictures and they get to go and they get to explore campus and they get to take group selfies together. So at the end of the, at the end of the event, they can kind of make like this nice collage and they'll sort of remember, oh, this was my group. And we went around to all these places as well as these will also go towards points for, uh, the Frosh trophy, which I will actually show off in a little bit as well. Follow it up, we have lunch. This is um, this is the main point of contact for our Froshies to actually speak to professors. Because this event typically happens in September, the interactions that they've had with their professors has mostly been in lecture. This is the first time they get to see their profs outside. And we always have at least one or two professors from every department in science come out, as well as representatives from the Faculty of Science. And these Froshies get to know that, you know, they're cared for on, on all sorts of levels by our student leaders, by our faculty, by our staff and such. Um, I don't think I actually mentioned the theme of Frosh this year. It's a carnival theme. So we'll be doing carnival rentals and we will be uh, setting up sort of like a carnival fair in the Convocation Mall slash the AQ South side, which is in front of C9001. There'll be prizes. So they'll really get that carnival experience. Following that, we'll have a group photo. Uh, typically we do this out by the pond or such, but this year we'll be doing it on top of the SFU stairs. Uh, following that, we have capture the flag which um, this year we've adjusted capture the flag to be indoors in the AQ, seeing as the event is in January. And we have uh, specific COVID plans made up for this to ensure that this event happens safely. Following that, we have dinner and trivia. We will actually be getting uh, pasta 
and lasagna. And we'll be having garlic bread, so garlic bread committee. If you uh, want to come out and sample some garlic bread, definitely look out for that. Um, you guys are more than welcome to come as well. Following dinner, we have our newspaper music or uh, sorry, newspaper musical chairs. Um, for this, again, we'll be splitting into smaller groups to make sure that we're doing social distancing and we're not having large clusters. Um, then we have balloon animals and board games. So over the last like month, I've actually got uh, pretty good at making balloon animals. So I'll be teaching all the frosh volunteers how to make balloon animals. And then they'll be teaching the froshies and such, and there'll be competitions and stuff. So if you want to know how to make balloon animals, let me know. I'd be more than happy to show you. Um, and that's sort of where our daily events end. Um, at this point, we have the after dark events. So around 1150, we walk all of our frushies in a large group who want to go home for the night up to the upper bus loops, they can catch the last bus and groups of volunteers to make sure that they're completely safe. And then they're free to go. People are allowed to stay if they wish. And then they can go to the after dark events in which we have dodgeball, we have hide and seek. Um, and we show off a movie at some at one point during the night. Following that, we have breakfast. So we walk all of our frushies over to the dining hall and we get uh, we basically get them a voucher. So it's an all-you-can-eat breakfast on sus. And then to finish it off, we do a closing ceremony. Um, in the closing ceremony, we all just sing a big collective song and then I'm hoping to rickroll them this year. So shh, no spoilers, you know. Um, but that's kind of the plan for the day. Now, as, as you can see, the Frosh Trophy is showed off there. I was really proud of my Froshies. I think my head's a little cut off in the right corner there, but you can kind of see it. Um, and we always get out in large groups. Okay. Um, mechs and room bookings. Now, I do recognize that in this time, uh, there was an email sent out last week basically saying that Mechs isn't doing bookings um, after 5.30 p.m. and on weekends. So over the last week, I have been in contact with Anna and with Corbett. And I know Corbett mentioned to me that there's been a meeting scheduled for early next week, as well as um, Anna has been reaching out on our behalf. In the event that you know these guidelines continue till then, we have alternatives to do it on weekdays and to eventually, if that isn't feasible to sp uh, split it up across a multiple days. So we have thought about um, in the situation that we aren't allowed to do this, what would happen? Okay, the budget. Um, so we're asking for a collective of $9,000 to sponsor this event. We will get funding from other sources, but these are sort of the large scale ones we ask for help from the SFSS, um, starting with our pizza lunch. So this comes out to about $1,000. This is simply, um, this is a little bit more expensive than normal. And the reason that this is more expensive than normal is because there's COVID guidelines that are individually packaged foods. So Uncle Fatiz has agreed to give us about 480 to 500, some individually small two slice packaged extra large boxes. So this will be to maintain um, in guidelines with that. And I've cleared this by Anna, who I met with three weeks ago when we gave her the initial event plan. Um, our dinner from Koto Catering, which is about $2,500. Um, again, the reason that this is so expensive is there are additional costs to individually package them into five to eight uh, ounce boxes, along with the garlic bread to again, maintain the packaging and that they'll have to bring it up. I do recognize that the SFSS has catering rules around using SFU specific services. However, um, they might not be able to satisfy such a large group. And that's why we have looked to external sources. Anna and I are double checking this as we had a meeting yesterday and we are in constant communication. So this is changing, but the amount would still not exceed this in the event that we have to switch over. Um, T-shirts are about 2,500. Um, we're getting them from T-shirt printing company. A lot of groups in science um, have used this company before and we've been very happy with their products. So we'll be continuing to use them as they give us pretty good discounts. Carnival games and utilities uh, is about $1,000. So we have Fraser Valley Party Rentals is the company we'll be sort of uh, renting the carnival games for from and they'll be coming in and they'll be setting up and they'll be again teaching our volunteers how to run all of these events safely and how to set up and how to clean up and to make sure that they are fully educated on the day of of how to run things efficiently. Um, again this is a carnival so we ask for $250 for decorations. This includes things like lights, carnival accessories, setting up for booths, that kind of thing. Uh, we have a $250 for prizes. Again it's not a carnival if you can't go to the gift shop and trade in your tickets for, you know, some nice toys and stuff. So there'll be that. Uh, about $500 for rentals. This includes things like the AV equipment, fog machines, and such. And again, for some of the carnival booths as well. 
Uh, drinks and snacks is about four hundred and twenty dollars. Um, again, their drinks are small scale. They're all, they're all you know canned. As for the chips bags, they're not the large scale ones. They're the small scale ones that you get that are about twenty four in a in a pack, and they're the smaller ones. That's why again this comes out to quite a bit for this. Um, in terms of drinks, we'll also have Red Bull uh, giving us um, some drinks as well. And then we have about a 500 con uh, contingency fee to um, account for purchases that might have to be made on the day of. Frosh is a really large scale event and we always get a lot of volunteers and organizers out for it. So sometimes it has to be things that are bought on the day of and people have to run to places. So having that contingency fee in there is a nice uh, addition. Thank you all for listening to my presentation. I really appreciate your time. I hope that you guys enjoy it and uh, I hope to see many of you out at Frosh. Thank you. Amazing, thank you so much, Shariq. Shariq, are you available for um, questions if there are any from council? Yes, sure. Awesome, so the floor is open for questions if there are questions or comments. Ben, go ahead. How many people are you capping it at? Uh, we're capping it at 200 people for this event, but again, it will be spread out and we have uh, ran this through Anna to make sure that this is an okay plan to go ahead for the event. And we didn't start any of this planning until we had the okay from the SFSS to go ahead with something like this. Perfect. Corbett? Yeah, thank you, uh, Shriek, for the presentation. Um, I had a question, I'm, I'm passing this, this question on from uh, another exec who couldn't be here. Um, how are you making the event accessible? Like we have a, the accessibility committee actually has like a, a an accessible events guideline that we can share with you. But uh, generally, have you had a chance to see that ahead of time? Um, I have not seen that, but in terms of accessibility, we recognize that we are checking for things like proof of vaccine. So I will personally be making the effort for anyone who is immunocompromised and they cannot come out to the event, say, for anything that's out of their control. I will be making my 100% effort to make sure that they can come out to this and that they can be included as well. Just as one example. And we have an event and logistics committee that is consistently working on this and the guidelines for this as well. But I would be very happy to uh, look over that uh, guidelines from the Accessibility Committee. Zay, did you have a follow-up to that? Yeah, um, basically also for on the topic of accessibility, basically I think all of the event is going to be held at the 3000 level in the AQ and then Convo Mall. So it is wheelchair accessible, um, all of the uh, spaces that we're going to be using for this event. Uh, Abby. Yeah, I was going to speak in favor of this event. Uh, even going back into Frosh history, I've never heard someone say a bad thing about Frosh, and this year looks like it's going to be a step up to even that, so I'm sure science students will enjoy it. Uh, my question was, given that you guys are having late night um, events after 11.50, I believe you said, um, do you guys have any sort of rest area for students who may be worn down by that time? That's a really good question. So we have uh, gender neutral sleeping rooms that we've consulted with the SVSBO over and we'll be deferring to their judgment on this to make sure that if people are tired, um, they can come out to this event. We tell them um, in terms of what to bring for the event. If they wish to sleep, they are more than welcome to and we will give them the space. And we have it in a confined space where to make sure the volunteers will consistently be monitoring that space to ensure their safety above all else. Beauty, thank you. Thank you for the question. Chloe. Um, I just wanted to say, I think it's really great that you opened it up to second years as well. You know, as a, as a second year who did start their university experience during the pandemic online, like, and feeling like I really missed out. Um, I think it's great that you did that. I was just wondering about the 200 person person's limit. Um, is that like, like, do you sign up for the event and then you're committed to every single day? And like, it's just the first 200 people to sign up or is it like a by day or like a by event basis? So one of the things that I um, included in the grant proposal was ticket prices. So we do charge ticket prices for our frosh. Um, I think this year we're doing $15 early bird to $20 normal. So um, you pay for the ticket and then you're allowed into the event for the entire day or the entire week in this case, assuming that we have to switch over depending on what mechs and uh, we go forward with. Okay, thank you. Almas. Oh, let me read this out loud. Um, Almas has typed a, a message in the chat. 
uh, love the whole plan, Sharik and Zaid. Great job. I've never attended one, but I am excited to join. it. I have a question about engagement. I can't speak on behalf of everyone, but I feel that international students are specifically lost when they start university because of reasons like um, being in a new country and a new environment. I think such events would make them more comfortable, but how do you plan to target them, given that they are very new to the Canadian university experience? Also, how will you check the vaccination status since a lot of international students have vac uh, vaccine passports that our Canadian apps do not read? Um, so to answer the first question, again, um, this, this not only applies for international students, but also for marginalized communities on campus. We'll be reaching out to constituency groups and such and um, to advertise this event as we want to make it as inclusive as we can. Um, to answer your question about the checking the vaccine uh, cards for it, um, we are currently under in the process of looking um, so when we do the sign up form, we ask them for a certain amount of information. And in the event that, you know, they have a vaccine passport from a different country, we will be deferring to sort of the guidelines of that country and checking uh, accordingly on how to check that. So we have thought ahead of that and the logistics committee has um, drafting up uh, guidelines on that as well. Awesome. Joe Sal? Yeah, uh, this is a great presentation and it sounds really exciting. Um, this is like more of like a concern, let's say like throughout the break, you know, like um, if cases rise and such and public health orders change, do you guys have a backup plan um, if your capacity has to be decreased or your certain activities have to be decreased? I'm just curious. Yes. So this was uh, in relation to as well as the bookings and stuff. So we have planned uh, two, three alternatives. Um, one being, again, the half day. So in the event that Mech says that we can't go longer than 530, as they currently say right now, and that'll extend to January, um, we'll cut down the event to basically end around 530. Um, a lot of the finances and large scale expenses are before the after dark event anyway. So we would still be using up quite a lot of the funding because, again, a lot of it comes for things like T-shirts, lunch and dinner, which would all be sort of covered up beforehand. And what about like capacity? So like, let's say that everything else checks out, but public health orders kind of like reduce, want to reduce the amount of people that attend. Is that something that you folks will be doing? Yes. So assuming we will be uh, following the PHOs um, and assuming that they do not allow such large scale things because things like certain concerts and stuff are already being canceled potentially. So um, we have made plans to decrease uh, the amount of people who could come to this event. Um, uh, a thing with that as well. So our first year reps um, at SUS have been working on their own event as well. So they will be doing an event for first years as well. So in the event that um, we have to cut down on the number of people, we have alternatives again for first year events to have to give them that opportunity to mingle amongst their cohorts and such. Any other questions? Alrighty, thanks again for the presentation. Um, we are voting in a couple of agenda items on this grant, um, so stick around. All right, thanks everyone. So that concludes presentations. We have one item under new business, um, and then we'll move into new business, which will be the first two are the, the grants. Um, but we have to get the um, old business under our belt first. So I'll read our first motion of the day, which is 7.1. Policy change, council half hours for final exam periods. This was submitted by the VP internal and organizational development. And I'll read the question now. Uh, whereas past council policies included a reduction in expected hours without a reduction in stipend for that last month of each term to accommodate final exams and projects for council members. Whereas these policies were removed from the policy manual in 2015, um, along with the expected hours. Whereas in 2020, the board of directors brought back policies around expected work hours for executive and board members to meet to be met semi-monthly. Be it resolved that council adopt the following policy changes. Now, I'm not gonna read all, all of the changes out, um, but the paragraph is listed um, on the agenda of the changes that are being made. Um, so I will ask, is there a mover for the motion? Corbett moves. Corbett moves. Do I have a second? 
Political science. Seven. Political science seconds, Abby seconds. All right, so the motion's been moved and seconded. Corbett, you were the mover and the author of the motion. You have the floor to um, introduce it. Sure, thank you. Um, so, uh, so this was brought uh, to council last week as part as a finish of a notice of motion. Um, and there was a request to postpone uh, so that uh, council could council members could uh, go back to their student unions, uh, students and students groups and affiliated student groups to uh, have further discussion on it. Um, before going into my own stuff, I kind of want to know if that happened um, and if if people still need feel they need to do more uh, outreach with their students because there is quite a few of us um, because you know, as much as I'd like to have this policy change now, we can delay it for until like January if necessary, or if, if it allows you to um, give you more time, especially because we're coming at the end of the term. Um, I also wanted to be able to submit out a much more detailed briefing note with rationale and, and different stuff because I was the one who developed this or brought back this policy and pushed uh, put it out. But I found I was just way too tired by the end of last week uh, to get it out, uh, get it drafted up and out for everyone. Um, and so I don't want to immediately just start move to propose phone, but I kind of wanted to ask how people feel about this first. Thanks, Corbett. I think we'll see maybe as we go down the speakers list what people's thoughts are. Um, so we'll begin with uh, Almas. Uh, and I believe Almas is speaking to the motion via Devin. Yeah, I'm going to read what Almas said, uh, sent me. So please bear with me. Um, so it reads, there are a few reasons for why I support this. Number one, at the last council meeting, it was mentioned that some students do not get this advantage during final exams, so it's unfair to provide it to council members. I would only partially agree with this as it's, not, as it's worth noting here that the SFS operations are very different from any other job. While a person might have the benefit of worked fixed hours, working certain days, or even moving around their work schedule by switching shifts, I am sure that all of you have realized now, now that our work is quite different. We are working at, at various hours during the day, in brackets, often not at a fixed duration, end of bracket. This semester, I have even had uh, times where I had to miss classes to prioritize SFSS work. This uh, it can cause issues for marginalized students who wish to be part of advocacy and the SFSS, but cannot do it in a um, at the cost of their education. Hence, unlike other employees, the least we can do is understand the needs of students, present and future, to make sure that they are appropriately given resources to perform their duties as well ensure accountability. Number two, I would also like to mention that this policy was in place for quite some time and not a new offering. Here, I would like to shed some light on the fact that some of us have consistently failed to meet the hours throughout this semester and not just during exam season that are expected of us. This is partly because people have other commitments, in brackets personal or academic, end of bracket, due to which they will mostly come to council meetings only and take on additional tasks. This is completely understandable given that all of us have different capacities, especially during exam season. In the past, it has often been noted that people are forced to take LOAs closer to exams since it's very difficult to balance work during busy times of the year, and some of us who are not fortunate enough to have support from family have to work and take a lot more of a mental toll. So I believe if we're truly trying to be inclusive, this is the very least we can do as students uh, is to understand that there's a genuinely significant amount of stress during an exam period and make our workplace more accessible to folks. Number three, half hours does not mean that folks will sit back and cut down on their work. It is just an assurance to them that they, for the time being, they can prioritize their academic work. I'm sure but the majority of us will be working and still doing stuff that falls under their portfolios, but it will cut down the extra stress of taking on everything at once. I am hopeful that this will be uh, make the situation a little more clear. Thanks. That's the end of uh, Almas' statement. Thanks, Devin, um, for reading that and, and Almas for typing it out. Um, ben, you can go ahead. I'll retract my list for now. I just had a very similar question to what Corbett had asked everyone. Okay. So Devin, you can go ahead for yourself. 
<laughs> so I'm gonna have a break, but it's okay, I can go. Um, yeah, I just kind of, I recently uh, was thinking about this and I recently took an LOA just for six days, three of them being a weekend. And I just want to kind of talk about my experience taking an LOA. I took it because, you know, sometimes you have to have like a productive mental breakdown and it worked for me. I had one. I'm good. Um, but um, during that time, I, I didn't do a lot of SFS work. I did attend some meetings, but specifically towards my oversight committee, I pushed it aside and what I, I didn't call a meeting um, and I didn't answer inquiries. And that was because I was on my leave. But now we need to elect a new uh, chair. We need to elect a new vice chair. We were supposed to do that tomorrow, but I didn't do any of the work to call a meeting. So first of all, apologize to oversight. But the reason I bring this up is because just because somebody is on a leave of absence doesn't mean the other people stop uh, who they, like they rely on. Like people don't stop relying on you. The work still needs to be done. And so when somebody takes a leave of absence, everyone else still working there full time. And so if we all are given half hours and we can all work half hours, that gives us an opportunity as a whole for us all to create priorities that work with each other, as well as it makes so if somebody isn't completing the same amount of work, that it all doesn't start to domino effect onto every other everybody else's work. I don't know if that makes sense, but we have to understand that we're working together. This is a joint effort. No one's on their own here. And so if somebody is trying to work their full 20 hours, but somebody because of exams does not have the capacity to work those hours. Because you know what? I, I think it's one of those things, as much as we can say, we're gonna try those work hours. Some people are going to have a lot more exams. Some people are going to have a lot harder exams, depending on what year they're in or just how their class schedule worked out. And they can't give the hours, but somebody else is trying to give 20. There's going to be a disconnect and the work is not actually going to be more productively done. It's just going to put that stress on that one person and the work is going to be left undone. And so I think this policy allows us all to work together to prioritize. Um, around this period of time, what needs to be done, start planning for the next term of what needs to be done, um, as well as give everyone a break so less leave of absences during this time need to happen, which means that uh, I don't let my team down when I or my committee down when I can't follow through because I'm on a leave of absence. I hope that sort of made sense. Thanks. Thank you, Devin. Um, Abby, you're up next. Thank you, Gabe. Um... I wanted to say I really, really hope people took the extra week we had to go and do the research and get the numbers for their constituency groups or their DSUs. Um, I'm personally going to be voting in favor of this motion purely for the reason that via the survey that we did, more students voted in favor of this motion than against. And I highly encourage every DSU uh, representative to follow the um, the advice they were given by their constituents, given that we represent these people, to vote against what the students wants. That's what the students want seems very contrarian. Thanks, Abby. Natasha? Hi. Um, Devin answered uh, most of my question. My question was mostly on how a couple of weeks ago we allowed for, I believe, the executive team to A, take their time on the FSSS as a co-op placement, as well as take LOA, which I'm, I'm happy that you all have been able to take time for your mental health and for your physical health. Um, so Devin didn't answer that question, but I was wondering if any other executive member wants to also add on to that. And also I was wondering um, just about the workload, about how it is like the end of a year and the end of a semester and how like with reduced hours, how will like all the work get done? And I understand that Sometimes there might be more work, but also it is a busy time. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, Corbett, did you want to go ahead? Yeah, I can answer Natasha's question and also add on my own thoughts. Um, so the there's a couple of things that happen. This is what happened to me last year as the VP of Finance. Um, uh, we, I still worked during the semester break a bit not not i did take days off but and i worked a little bit less but i still had to get some stuff done mostly in the sense of planning for next next spring uh because you know there's especially now that uh, with elections will be starting in and um the, the process will be starting in early January and going until mid-February. Uh, there's there's some planning and strategies and stuff you have to do in an executive role. 
Um, but being able to have some flexibility, ideally with you know me being able to take some leave of absences or or just be able to take a good chunk of that semester break off would be helpful. Um, uh, yeah, so that this and then, and it will vary from position to position based on what they're working on. Like in my case, because now in this new role as VP internal, I tend to oversee the making sure the elections and referendum process happens. Um, so I'll have a bit more work to do over the break, but depending on, you know, if the SFU does something dumb, then maybe Gabe, Gabe as president or, or Serena as, you know, um, VP university might or might not have to do some a bit of work uh, to jump in or to respond. Um, and so it's good, it's really going to vary from position to position. Um, as for my own thoughts on, on this policy, I think from fun, fundamentally we should have policy that mirrors our experiences as students. Um, so because we have, especially in December, uh, we have a week, theoretically a week or two off, depending on how it all fits in with like the calendar um, and when school starts, uh, that we should have, take that into account um, to give everyone a rest, as much as a rest as possible, as well as be able to give time uh, for people to, to focus on finals and final projects and final assignments. Um, and, and that happens in December, it happens in August and happens, sorry, yeah, in August and, and in April. Um, and so I think we should have policies that, that reflect that. Um, the reason why it doesn't drop, I'm, I'm not in favor of, say, reducing the hours and then reducing stipends is because, for, for kind of two main reasons. One, uh, because our work is not always predictable on when we'd be working or not, or when we have to work, especially if you have to respond to something that's happened uh, in, you know, you know, out in the rest, outside of SFU, in SFU, within the organization, et cetera. Um, and not, I'm not just talking about the exact that it could also be working groups or, or other kinds of uh, some committees that are, might be, have to be called in suddenly or have to get pay attention to what's going on and maybe respond to something, um, which would be then counselors and even student at largest to a certain extent. Um, but also we as both the employers as well as ourselves, like as an employee body, we can also set policies to kind of set a standard of how we think other employers and other groups and organizations should should treat its own people, it should how it treats its student employees, how it treats itself um, and its leadership group. Um, and then we can also then use that for advocacy. Like we, if we set some kind of standard, like, like we've done for like working towards more of a living wage standard for all our students elected, appointed and hired uh, people, members, um, we can also then use that to go to SFU and, and maybe other groups to say if that makes sense to say, you know, do what we're doing too. Be compassionate uh, during these periods of time. You you know maybe you don't maybe you save a bit of like maybe you pool a bit of money to be able to keep paying them for you know periods of time during their finals so that they can also are not financially hard, um, hurt because suddenly their hours got or went down. I've had that personal experience working for IT services as a student temp, where a lot of the hours would just disappear uh, during finals. And I would have to get some extra side jobs or side work within the department or outside to you know, keep paying bills. Um, so I think if we can come up with a, a, a solution to support both our uh, all our students at all levels in the SFS, we can then go out and say other people should be doing this as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Corbett. Um, and the last person on the speakers list, at, at least as of right now, is uh, Beatty, our Policy Research and Community Affairs Coordinator. Hi, um, I just wanted to add some thoughts on this um, to emphasize or suggest some considerations on this policy more so the procedural implication in terms of staff. So what happens when if a counselor that is working directly with staff is, um, is having an exam or during this period, is there, is there a way we can brainstorm discussion in a way that on the other side where we are working with staff, we are made aware of um, 
the implications of this, and we develop our staff policies. Uh, it, it could be operational policies, it could be uh, hiring policies, or just anything that is related with the council that you're working with, like with the team, so, so that we are made aware that when planning, for example, for the annual plans, we know that during exams or when uh, schools, when, when school is on break, uh, the workload of staff and how we operate is also affected in one way or another. So if we could just also discuss the procedural implications of this in terms of staff, that will be uh, a good point of consideration. Thank you, Bidi. Uh, Corbett, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Bidi. Uh, currently, this is would just this policy itself would only fall under um, executive and or council as a whole, including executives. Um, and and their their hours to uh, expect a commitment of hours, um, so yeah, it would have an impact on s s staff support for those people, um, and so we can definitely talk about what that would look like. Um, to a certain extent, we're already we I think we've kind of naturally been going up, depending on the, the the term and stuff, having less meetings or or shorter meetings or sort of other work in those months, but this would be more formalized if it is passed. Um, but yeah, we can definitely have a me, Gabe, and others can have a follow-up with staff about it if this this policy passes. Okay. All right, any final thoughts? Thomas, yeah, please go ahead. Um, I'd also like to mention that Marie, Gabe, and Corbett usually have over 60 hours in like every single work report. <laughs> so if we talk about people working half hours, I, I, I can at least promise that, you know, in our portfolios, there's nothing like completely leaving work and just chilling. Like you always have to work, but if you take it all away, then you're sort of away from office, but you're still working. So that just doesn't sit right with a time like this. So that's why I feel like the half hours policy makes much more sense than taking an LOA and saying, well, I'm going, but then you're still not gone. You're still doing the work. And, you know, people often don't get paid for any extra hours that they put in otherwise. So I think it sort of, so, it sort of balances that as well. Thank you, Almas, for that. <laughs> um. Okay, well, there's no one else on the speakers list. So at this time, I think it's safe to, to put this question to a vote. And so uh, we are voting on adopting the following policy changes as they're laid out on the agenda. And so I'll put it to a vote now. Um, and also just as a reminder, this is a policy amendment. So it's a two, two thirds threshold for it to pass. Um, so all those in favor of seeking unanimous consent, um, if you would like to vote against or abstain, please use the Zoom raise hand feature to indicate um, your, your preference. And um, if there is at least one hand, we have to go to a roll call vote. But Natasha? Yeah, I'm very sorry. I did talk over with my student union group, but um, there was some discussion around it. And since the geography student union hasn't had a formal uh, meeting, these were just discussions over discord. Um, I do not feel confident casting a vote in this as um, uh, some of the opinions were contrasting. So geography would like to abstain. I do appreciate the discussion and thank you um, for all the words. And I do um, believe that the vote will be good. Anyways, thank you, <laughs> sorry. It's okay, no worries. So we will have to move to a roll call vote on this one, um, just because we do have some um, um, objections. So let me just get myself set up here um, and I will record that vote. And I'm gonna have to call on everyone um, by position. And um, if you can just please be ready to indicate verbally by unmuting yourself, whether you're voting in favor, against or abstaining, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, so we'll begin with archeology. span uh, In favor. Behavior, be a uh, bachelor environment. In favor. 
behavioral neuroscience. Um, sorry, Gabe, I just joined the meeting. So can I just uh, get a clarity on what motion we're voting on? Of course, we're under old business and we're voting on the policy change for council half hours. Okay, uh, I'm gonna be against. Okay, biology. In favor, okay. Biology votes in favor, BPK. In favor. Chemistry. In favor, cognitive science. Communications, computing science. Criminology. Data science. Abstain. Economics. Against. Education. En engineering science. Abstain. English. In favor. Environmental science. In favor. Film. French. In favor. GSWS. In favor. Health science. In favor. History. Indigenous studies. IAT. In favor. International studies. Labor studies. Linguistics. In favor. Math. In favor. Megatronics. Sorry, was that an abstention? Okay, I was seeing a nod, so I'm going to assume it's an abstention. MBB. Operations research. In favor. Philosophy. In favor. Physics. In favor. Political science. In favor. Psychology. In favor. Science. In favor. SAS. In favor. Sociology and anthropology. In favor. Software systems. Statistics. Sustainable energy engineering. No statistics votes in favor. Um, theater. Abstain. World Lit. Um, FNMISA. Uh, ISA. Theater. SOCA. Women Center Collective. SAC. In favor. The president votes in favor. VP internal. In favor. VP finance and services. In favor. VP external and community affairs. And did anyone not have an opportunity to cast a vote? All right, labor studies is just let me know that they're voting in favor. All right, so on this vote, the yes votes were 28, the no votes were two, and there were five abstentions, so this motion is carried. Thanks, everyone. So um, I think we can get through one, one more motion and then we'll take a break, um, about a 10 minute break, get everyone um, up and moving and hopefully a bite to eat. We'll consider um, 8.1, which is Storm Hacks 2022. Um, this was submitted by um, the VP Internal and Organizational Development. And I'll read the question now. Whereas SFU Surge is an SFSS club that hosted Storm Hacks 2021, whereas the 2019 and 2020 SFSS Board of Directors approved spending of up to $15,000 to support their event, Whereas SFU Surge is preparing to hold Storm Hacks 2022 in the spring and has requested $20,000 of, $20, of funding from the SFSS to support their event. 
whereas they will need financial support above what staff and admin can provide, whereas SFU Search has provided a proposal and budget to staff, whereas SFU Search um, has presented a proposal and the budget to council, whereas SFS staff and the VP internal and organizational development have reviewed the proposal, be it resolved that council approve spending of up to X dollars from line item 4000 G to support storm hacks 2022. Do I have a mover? Political science. Political science moves. Is there a seconder? Health science. Health science is seconds. All right. Questions or comments on the grant request? I know we had an opportunity to ask some questions and have some discussion earlier, but this is an opportunity for any final questions or discussion on this. Corbett, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Corbett, I should have offered you the floor. You you put the, the motion forward. Thank you. I'll, I'll uh, not take this slight. <laughs> <laughs> the heart. Um, okay. So, um, Mostly, I just wanted to say, like, yeah, they gave a good presentation. Uh, we had a number of, you know, back and forth, a lot of QA, which was great to hear. Um, uh, I did check with staff ahead of time or, or ask for feedback from staff ahead of time about uh, things like, is there any, it, since this would be a club, of, uh, since SEF Surge is a club and they are a club, um, sorry, this, yeah, because their hackathon is a club, it would be viewed as a club event. It comes from the club. Uh, grant line item and I asked if you know if there was any concerns about um, you know maybe needing a certain amount of money set aside for the fall for other types of events and such because sorry for the spring because oftentimes there's a lot of big events during the spring a lot of formals and and other larger stuff um, I didn't get any kind of response back or any concerns from the um, uh, raised about the the grant and and other things I think just for the most part we're just in a trying to sort out if we're going to have issues actually ho like hosting the event based on, you know, COVID changes in the spring or, or stuff with SFU. Uh, but I think financially we can handle uh, this larger grant of the 20,000 up to a 20,000. Um, and of course, it, the motion up to, up to say up to 20,000, the full amount they're requesting doesn't necessarily mean they'll spend all the 20,000. Um, you know, often at, up to the event, day of the event, things can change, finances can change, like you maybe get better sponsorship than expected. So we'll, if this is approved by council, we, you know, our, our staff will be um, working with them to, you know, keep the budget updated and keep making sure like uh, the, the contracts and the sponsorships and stuff are all okay, because we'll be signing on their behalf. Um, if myself, I'll be definitely, I'll most likely be involved in that process. So uh, for most part, I, th I think this is a good event to support, keep to continue to support um, and going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Corbett. Corbett, can I ask you a question just because you did submit the motion? So it, it does say X dollars. Is that intended for council to decide the amount? Yeah, because um, yeah, I wasn't sure how the presentation would go or if people would be right, you know, think that maybe it's too much or too little or what. Yeah. Most likely it's too much. Um, so we can, I can amend it or anyone can amend it a, a dollar amount if I think it's more appropriate. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Ben, you can go ahead. Well, that was what my question was. So I guess I'll amend it to replace X with 20,000. All right. So we have a motion um, to amend X with 20,000 and it was moved by Ben. Um, looks like Zaid has seconded it in the chat there. So we have a, an amendment on the floor to strike X and replace it with 20,000. Is there any questions or comments on the amendment on the floor, specifically about the dollar amount, which is 20,000? <laughs> um, all right, so I'm seeing no questions or comments. So we're gonna put the amendment to the main motion to a vote, which again is to strike X and replace it with $20,000. Um, we're going to put this to a vote now. All those in favor of the amendment to the main motion seeking unanimous consent. Um, if you would like to vote against or abstain, please raise your hand via the Zoom raise hand feature at this time. 
So the amendment to the main motion has carried unanimously um, as there is no objections. And so we're back to the main motion um, and the motion now um, includes the dollar amount, which is $20,000. So we can resume debate on the main motion, which is approving the grant request. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, we'll put this to a vote then. Um, so be it resolved to approve spending of up to $20,000. Oh, wait, what line item is it coming from? Oh, sorry, I didn't include that in the motion. It says 4,000 dash G. Oh yeah, that's the line item for, um, for grants from um, student unions. Oh, okay. Sorry, not students you use them for clubs. Okay. Yeah, it's I different saw, than all our other ones. I just saw the letter and I freaked out. Yeah, G means grant. <laughs> okay, okay, sounds good. Um, okay, so resuming, um, the, the motion reads, be it resolved that council approve spending of up to $20,000 from line item 4,000-G uh, to support Storm Hacks 2022. Um, all those in favor of the motion seeking unanimous consent, if you'd like to vote against or abstain, please use the Zoom raise hand feature to indicate your preference. All right, this is carried, uh, carried unanimously. I wanna push it and do the sus vote as well before we go to a break, I think we can do it. So apologies, I lied, but we're gonna do this one and then go to a break. Um, so we're gonna consider 8.2, which is sus spring frosh. This was submitted by Corbett as well. So whereas the Science Undergrad Society is a faculty student union under the SFSS, whereas they're hosting a welcome back event in the spring for students in the Faculty of Science, whereas they are requesting $10,000 to support their event, whereas they will need financial support above what staff and admin can approve, whereas they have submitted a grant, um, a grant to staff, whereas they have presented to council and provided a proposal, be it resolved that council approves spending of up to X dollars from line item 5,000 G to go toward supporting their event. Do I have a mover? Zaid moves. Zaid moves, thank you. Is there a seconder? Political science. Yes. Political science seconds. All right, questions or comments on the, on the motion? Corbett, I have to give the floor to you first because you, you were the author, but and then Ben can go after that. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, sorry, I also realized when I, at the, the previous motion I was talking about, worried about Mex and Hold Events one is, uh, Storm Hacks was a virtual event, so my mistake. Uh, but yes, similar kind of perspective for uh, Cess's Frosh and Welcome event. Um, I, I've organized multiple, uh, two froshes for CSSS, um, so I know the value of them and I'm in favor of them quite strongly. Um, and uh, so I'm glad that they also had a presentation and they were thinking about you know, alternatives in case COVID and, um, and or SFU uh, throw some wrenches into it. Um, and we'll be meeting to hopefully not have that happen to them and other student groups uh, for the spring, um, but uh, yeah, I'm in favor of supporting this event and, and these larger frosh type events. So thank you. Thank you, Corbett. Um, ben, you can go ahead now. Yeah, so I'm also completely in favor of supporting these types of events. I think they're great to have on campus. And as I did on the last motion, I'll move to amend the motion to replace X with $10,000. Amazing. So um, we have uh, an amendment on the floor. Um, is there a second? I'll second I'll second. I was waiting for you, Abby. You let your guard down. Okay, um, so we have a motion on the floor to strike X with $10,000. Um, any questions or comments on the amendment? All right, we're gonna put this to a vote. All those in favor of this amendment to the main motion seeking unanimous consent. Seeing no objections, this is carried unanimously. Mm -hmm. um, so we're now back to the main motion, which has been amended to include the dollar amount, which is $10,000. Any questions or comments? 
on the main motion. Seeing none, we'll put the question to a vote. The main motion, which reads, be it resolved that council approves spending of up to $10,000 from line item 5000-G to go towards supporting their event. All those in favor seeking unanimous consent. This motion has been carried unanimously, seeing no objections. Okay, so um, we're gonna take a break now. Um, 10 minutes, so um, let's come back at six, let's say 6.35 um, and we'll reconvene and keep moving through new business. See you then. Hey everybody, we're gonna reconvene council. Um, so if you're away from your computer, just slowly but quickly make your way back. <laughs> um, and we'll continue on with our agenda. So we're under new business. We're at 8.3, which uh, the motion is titled Sub Multi-Faith Prayer Room Renovation. This was submitted by the VP Internal and Organizational Development, Corbett Gildersleeve, as was almost every single thing on today's agenda. And we, I will read the question now. Whereas the SFSS has approved a motion on April 9th, 2021 to allocate space in the sub for a multi-faith uh, multi -faith space to support prayer. Whereas the current space sub 2402 is larger than the current SFU multi-faith center's prayer room. Um, it needs some renovations and items purchased. Whereas the SFSS has consulted with SFU Multipurpose Center and Students of Faith concerning renovations and items to be purchased. Whereas these renovations and purchases include drywall, repainting, lock installation, door changes, floor tiles, storage, and mats costing an estimated $15,000. Be it resolved that council approve spending of up to $15,000 from the space expansion funds to pay for the renovation of the space and purchase of items as listed in the prayer room in the sub briefing note um, 251121 document attached. Did, do I have a mover? Corbett moves. Corbett moves. Do I have a second? Uh, data science, Warren. Warren seconds. Thank you. And Corbett, as the mover and author, you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so this has been in the works since, uh, in one form or another since, uh, basically, honestly, last year, we started, we got a request um, from students to develop uh, or develop a prayer room. Um, we've now changed it to be multi-faith multi prayer space. Uh, is it more of a title? Um, but the, the center of it, the whole idea of it is basically allows students of faith that need uh, time, or need a space uh, to pray, um, don't have to go all the way down to the multi-faith center in the AQ, which I think is also not very fully functional because they had a massive steam pipe rupture uh, like way last year during the pandemic, which wrecked the space and they've had renovations stuff, but it's still, it's not a, it's not a very large space. Uh, for what I understand, the prayer room there is really just basically kind of like a little bit bigger than a closet. Um, and so it's good for us to provide uh, space that's more central to the to, to in the campus, but also larger so more students can be supported. Um, thank you, uh, Hassan, for the correction. That was a flood. Um, and so uh, we had, we've had uh, talks back and forth, uh, we've gotten some feedback, and we, last year, we, the board selected a space in the sub. We, we fortunately had a, a room that's across from the gaming lounge that uh, had been unassigned. Um, so we, over the last, over the fall, we had it cleared out, but we also realized there was some, you know, nicks and scratches, and it would be good to repaint it and, and set it up properly. Um, and so John, the building manager, has been working with and, and Ella and our board coordinator has been working with Multifaith to get uh, this finalized and so get quotes in and kind of get this moving. And now we're at the point where we need to 
prove the spending. Um, and so, yeah, as, as the, the quote says, it's basically for painting, for some drywall work, um, and for some buying some cabinets and a few um, odds and ends for like mats and stuff to make it so people don't have to, to sit or kneel on cement floor, um, cement flooring. Uh, and this is a good first step. We'll have more, as students, more students use it, we'll get more feedback and we can come back and make improvements and changes. So thank you. Thanks, Corbett. The floor is open for any questions or comments on the motion. Devin, go ahead. Yeah, so I'm just curious uh, with this space, would it be a bookable space? So uh, um, a religious group on campus could uh, book it to do some type of group prayer or is it an always open space, kind of first come space where anyone can go at any time? Corbett? Thank you. As far as I understand, it's, it's drop-in. Um, you would have to go back to consultation with different students if it's a thing that should be bookable, a room that could be bookable, but there's, uh, but as far as I understand, it's primarily just drop-in um, to allow for more flexibility for uh, students of faith to use it. Thanks, Corbett. Abby, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to speak in favor of this motion. I think it's a good idea to get this renovation going, and I think a lot of students will get use out of it. So I'm in favor of the motion. Thanks, Abby. Any other questions or comments? All right, I'm seeing none. So we'll put the question to a vote, which is... Be it resolved that council approves spending of up to $15,000 from the space expansion fund to pay for the renovation of the space and purchase items as listed in the, in the document attached titled prayer room in the sub briefing note 251121. Um, um, all those in favor seeking unanimous consent. If you'd like to vote against or abstain, please use the Zoom raise hand feature to indicate your vote. All right, so this motion is carried unanimously. Thanks everyone. And we're going to move into 8.4, which is SAS and SAS Space Expansion Fund. This was submitted by Corbett um, as well. And so we'll move into, uh, I'll, <clears throat> I will read the question. Whereas the SFSS has allocated space in the Student Union Building for the Society of Arts and Social Sciences and the Science Undergrad Society um, on August 25th, 2021. Whereas the Memorandum of Understanding, Section 5C, states that the SFSS will be covering operational costs for these student groups, inclusive of furniture, furnishing. Whereas the Space Expan Expansion Fund has just under $800,000 in unspent funds and collects around three hundred and $50,000 in student levies. Be it resolved that council approves the spending of up to $65,000 Canadian for basic furnishing expenses, expenses for SAS and SUS from the Space Expansion Fund. Do I have a mover? Political science. Political science moves. Do I have a second? Science. Math seconds. All right, Corbett, did you want to introduce the motion? Yeah, so, um, yeah, I think this is one we'll actually have to merge, right, Gabe? Because they're technically just actually one motion for both groups. Yeah, the, so... The, the, the common room um, costings, right? Yeah, so the motion is for both SAS and SAS and an ex expenditure of $65,000. Okay, just, just to make sure, so we don't go to the next one. Like, you'll strike if the next one then, right? Yes, yeah. Okay. The, yeah, I, I, I believe... 8.5 is just a duplication. It was a clerical error, I think. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, thank you. Uh, this is in relation to the SAS and SAS common room furnishings. Um, me and John have been working with SAS and SAS uh, for, to develop the MOU, the memorandum of Hunting, for their space that they were allocated by council back in the summer. Um, council has passed those MOUs, and one of them is one of the aspects of it is that also the SFS will be funding 
uh, their the space the space furnishings, just like we've done for SOCA DNA and F the F and MSA, MISA. I'll take them all to get you adjusted. Um, but so they're they both groups have been working with John and and uh, furniture supplier to um, uh, to price out uh, to get uh, to excuse me to get the pricing for different items to to fill the space. So and it's uh, there was a um, a briefing note sent out last night. Uh, sorry for the delay, but it just, we didn't actually get the full quote until Monday, so it took a while to get it all finalized. Um, but it breaks down all the different items from chairs to tables to all the kind of standard stuff. Um, the reason why the price is a little bit higher, but it's uh, is primarily because they're we're purchasing um, commercial furniture, which should last longer, so it's kind of a initial cost, but saves us money in the long run for repair and replacement because it'll take longer for those items to degrade versus buying it from Ikea or something else, somewhere, somewhere else. Um, the, uh, but even still, the pricing is still within similar ranges we, we've we spent with, uh, we supported the cost for SOCA DNA and um, F and MISA. Um, and so I think, I believe this should pass and that I look forward to seeing the space actually fully decked out. And, and more functional than the current setup, which is most designed for flexible space, meeting rooms and such. Yeah, thanks, Corbett. Was there any other questions or comments on the motion? Devin, go ahead. Yeah, I was just curious if this, uh, because I just cannot remember if this spending was kind of the similar to the constituency group spending. So that was like SOCA, DNA, et cetera. Um, yeah, just curious if it's around the same or if it is different, why? Uh, same, yes, yeah, the same uh, in the sense of like from the same funding source, the Space Expansion Fund. Um, and it's just different furniture in the sense because each group like Soka DNA and um, First Nations, AT Inuit and um, Student Association is, um, and Soka all selected their own sources of furniture, what they prefer. Um, and it's been, and it's a mixture of, of outside as well as commercial grade furniture. Um, so this one, it was just, it, I think it was a bit more straightforward and, and allowed uh, SAS and SAS to meet with the, the people to get it ordered quick, more quickly. Um, honestly, SAS and SAS, if you have reps here that can speak to this, you're the ones who met. So I would recommend you jump in on that. Thanks, Corbett. Any further questions or comments? Shriek. Oh, Shriek, we can't hear you. I have to remember to put that down sometimes. Um, for uh, So for over the last month and a half, um, Sus and Sass have both met with Gunnar Pacific, which has provided a lot of the other furniture uh, in the sub. And we decided to go with this company specifically as to match the aesthetic of the rest of the furniture in the sub. Um, in terms of the pricing, it's mentioned in the briefing note that um, there is actually an in a 6% increase on uh, commercial grid furniture and such that is uh, coming to effect actually today. So that's why um, there has to be an extra fund put aside just in the event of um, more money that might potentially be needed for some of the furniture that comes into the room. Thank you, Sharik. Any, any more discussion? All righty, we're gonna move this along then. So we're, um, the motion on the floor reads, be it resolved that council approves spending of up to $65,000 Canadian for basic furnishing expenses for SAS and SUS from the Space Expansion Fund. All those in favor of this motion seeking unanimous consent. If you'd like to vote against or abstain, please raise your hand now via the Zoom raise hand feature. So this motion is carried unanimously. And so um, 
I'd like to move to strike 8.5 from the agenda um, due to a clerical error in um, this being a duplicate of 8.4. Um, can I just get a seconder? Seven seconds. Seven seconds. Um, yeah, so this is just a duplicate. Um, I think it was just added twice by accident. It is uh, an exact carbon copy of the motion we just voted on. Um, so um, we just need to vote to strike it. Um, all those in favor of striking this motion from the agenda, seeking unanimous consent. All right, carried unanimously. We'll move into 8.6, which is um, MGP 4.1.4.A, policy suspension, BC flood donations. This was submitted by Corbett. And there's a briefing note. Oh. Anyway, I'll read the question now. Um, it reads, whereas BC has sent, re BC has seen recent severe flooding due to extreme weather caused by climate change, which has impacted people in and outside of the SFU community. Whereas BC is expected to have additional flooding this week. Whereas the SFSS along with SFU, GSS and other organizations have already started to support these people affected affected through cash and physical donations. Whereas SFSS student unions and constituency groups have asked to be able to donate core funding as part of their support. Whereas MGP-4, 4.14.A, bars student unions and constituency groups from donating core funding to off-campus organizations. Whereas the SFSS previously suspended this policy from June 2020 to September 2020, to allow groups to donate their core to Black and Indigenous-led organizations and causes. Be it resolved that Council suspend MGP4 4.14.A until April 30th, 2022, to allow student unions and constituency groups to donate core funding to support organizations, groups, and causes supporting people affected by BC flooding. Is there a mover for this motion? Political science. Political science moves. Is there a seconder? Software systems. Ad. And software systems. Seconds. So Shashank seconds. All right. Corbett, as the author of the motion, did you want to introduce it? Yeah, thank you. Um, so it's, uh, we had, I, I saw it being asked in Discord chat from council about um, being able to donate core, what the rules were or some people already had done so. Um, and actually part of the discussion item, one of the discussion items, we're gonna revisit this, that, that aspect. Um, uh, but our current policies don't allow uh, groups to, student unions to, uh, to uh, apologies, it's getting late for me. Um, they don't allow student unions and constituent groups to donate their core to off-campus organizations. It means they could directly give core to, say, SFU to start up, say, a, uh, a scholarship or a bursary, some an award, or some other aspect. But um, because we've all, we looked last year um, to suspend uh, that policy um, after um, the Joy, George Floyd uh, murder, and all the resulting uh, discussion and, and activity around um, supporting Black lives and Indigenous um, members of the community. And so I thought it'd be a good idea to do the same thing again, uh, but this time for, for a little bit longer because we expect the flooding uh, to impact a lot of people for a lot longer, oh, for a long time. Sorry, I didn't want to imply that. Um, uh, racial injustice is not continuing. But um, so I think because we, we as a society is already, have already started to help uh, work towards supporting these people, I think it's only fair to allow uh, students, clubs, sorry, student unions and groups that want to do the same to have that ability to do so. So the way to do that is for council to suspend the policy. Uh, we could also have a further discussion at, at grant, sorry, at governance if we want to change the policy or remove it in the, uh, in the future completely. Um, but right now, I think the first step is just as we could suspend this if council wishes to. Thank you, Corbett. Are there any questions or comments? If 
Ben, go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm in support of suspending this policy to allow DSUs to do this. I know my DSU has already done this. Fantastic, thank you, Ben. Was there any other questions or comments from members of council? Seeing none, we'll put the motion to a vote then. And as a reminder, this is since we're um, this involves changing policy, it it, re it will require a two thirds majority to pass. So we'll put this to a vote. Be it resolved that council suspend MGP 414A until April 30th, 2022, to allow student unions and constituency groups to donate core funding to support organizations, groups, and causes supporting people affected by BC flooding. All those in favor seeking unanimous consent on the motion. All right, this is carried unanimously, which takes us to the end of new business uh, and into discussion items. So 9.1 is roundtable updates from non-executive councillors regarding flood donations. Now this was submitted by Jess and I don't know if Jess is here is just here. I uh, don't think so, but I she asked me to to work uh, bring this up or okay. to maybe talk about this. Go ahead. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, so the uh, from my understanding with Jess, she wanted to kind of piggyback off of the, the motion uh, asking which groups uh, like to kind of do a, a round table asking which which student groups uh, would like to donate core so we can kind of track it down as well. Um, and so we can also make sure staff knows ahead of time and checking to check with everyone and seeing which groups you'd like to be donating to and such. So I just wanna know if you, one, if you've had this discussion with your student group yet, or, and if so, has an action already taken or is there a talk about potential actions being taken? Thanks Corbett. Devin, go ahead. Yeah, I was just hoping to ask a clarifying question. From what I remember from last week, uh, we weren't accepting any monetary donations. And so the hope was to, to for HDSU to buy items such as like dog food or toys, gender neutral toys. Is that still the case? Or are we now uh, wanting DSUs to independently donate to uh, funds? And if so, is there a list of funds that we know have been like checked, but they're not? um using like we had a uh, red cross we talked about not being a good place to send your funds um and um or is the sfs accepting money basically is my question <laughs> i can i'm getting some messaging from jess uh yes we are accepting money because core is fine it's easier for us to track it or just to transfer it um so, sorry, I'm just, no, wait, no, we're not accepting money, sorry. <laughs> I'm kind of getting a messaging directly from, um, from Jess. Um, so, I'll check, I'll get back to you on that. Let's put it that way, uh, just double check. Okay, because right, Jess is on an LOA and she's still kind of working with the flood, she's still working and helping with the flood stuff, but she can be here today, so. And go ahead. Uh, so we at the MSU have passed a motion to donate 150 from CORE and purchase some items through that and donate them, I should say. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Abby? Thank you. Um, I actually had more of a question. Uh, we're going to be talking about this at our PSSU meeting tomorrow, but... Um, is there a way you guys recommend that a motion be drafted up in order to ensure more flexibility? Because um, I'm not sure if it would be smarter for us just to give the money to you guys to buy stuff or if we should individually be buying things and then getting reimbursed. Just some clarification on that would be great. Corbett? Uh, yes, we can. I, I'll definitely give clarity and send a, um, an email out to council. So I, I think mostly just um, Jess was curious about what actions have already been taken. Okay, so she just got back to me. Uh, she's asking student unions and student groups to motion to pass money to buy physical donations. Um, 
And I'll, I'll feed back your question, Abby, uh, about if you want uh, the SOS to buy it on your behalf or to do it yourself. So. And I'm just going to read out some of the messages in the chat just so that they're recorded. Um, Archaeology mentioned that um, it was brought up, but haven't had a chance to meet formally as a group to talk about it, but the next meeting it should be. Um, Hasusu ha Health Sciences Student Union has mentioned that um, uh, they passed a motion to take $200 from CORE to purchase items for donation. And BNSS has passed a motion to take $100 from CORE to purchase items to donate. They bought items today and dropped it off at the sub. Oh my gosh, nice. And chemistry also passed a motion to take $200 from CORE to purchase some items, which are still being discussed. Physics Student Association. Oh, oh. Physics Student Association passed a motion to allocate $200 to purchase items for donation. SAS discussed it on Tuesday and they're gonna vote to allocate $400 next week to buy items. BPK, it's been brought to their DSU. They'll likely be using core funding for donations as well, but there's also a discussion around people just buying things themselves and donating as per their ability. It will be finalized in today's meeting. <laughs> Joselle, you can go ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering the timeline for donations. Um, so is it just accepted on a rolling basis throughout December or is there like a hard end to when donations are stopping? Because I know Jess and Matt mentioned that this is an ongoing issue. So I'm just double checking. Mm -hmm. Corbett, do you know the answer to that? Uh, not yet, I said it to Jess, but um, she did give me a feedback for Abby's question. Uh, just, yeah, you're, you're free to buy stuff yourself, to go out and buy yourself. Mm -hmm. And no deadline from Jess, uh, Jess because it's going to be ongoing. So psychology also discussed the motion and still discussing the amount of money, but will likely be finalized later this week. English is discussing this next Tuesday, but our group chat, um, their group chat agreed to donate, just need to figure out the details. Judith, would you like to go ahead? Yes, thanks, Gabe. Um, we actually discussed potentially doing a fundraising event come January or February to support flood victims. And I'm wondering like how long the cutoff is going to be like and when it's going to stop being relevant, just to make sure we don't miss the deadline. Mm -hmm. Okay. Corbett, I'm assuming you're probably asking Jess. <laughs> um, no, sorry, I've been going back and forth because I'm also tracking on a spreadsheet what people have been putting in training. So saying um, donations for pickup is 15th um, because we have physically, like the building will be closed during the, the, the break from 23rd, I believe, to the 3rd. Um, so, but anything after that, we can, we can still accept anything after the 15th, December 15th. Um, and we'll just probably do multiple, um, pickups and stuff over maybe another big pickup in January once the building is open again. Geography, um, has discussed informally about their donation and we'll be working on it at their next meeting early next week. Um, for us to purchase on our behalf. If that's still available, we will also be bringing in donations as individuals. Devin, did you want to go ahead? Yeah, it's kind of a question slash an offer. I just like realize as we go into holiday season, not everyone has the funds to wait for a reimbursement or the credit card limit to do so. And so if there was a DSU um, that was having issues finding someone who was willing to front this, I'm really, um, I can. Uh, at the time and so if you really if it's okay for me to do that for a DSU and then seek reimbursement which it would be a question that I'd have to ask please and if that's allowed please reach out to me I am going to um, the mall on uh, Friday and what a Lego store and I'm going to try to go to uh, a Gap and Hudson's Bay and so yeah if there is a DSU um, I have the credit card limit to do so at the moment um, and uh, wait for a reimbursement. Thanks, Devin. Corbett, did you want to direct respond? Yeah, and thank you, Devin, for offering that. The SOS can, I believe, can do that as well for, like, he's kind of going off of what Ellen had typed in the chat that that they were going to contribute quite a bit, but it, expecting it to be part of the SOS initiative. So 
I think we can also do the same if, if you know, it's also easier for people. Um, so I think we can be flexible with what works with people and for timing and, and location. So, yeah. Thanks, Corbett. Um, just in the chat, I'm noticing um, HSU assumed that it would be donating toward SFSS uh, uh, initiatives for flood relief and plan to allot a thousand dollars toward this. So I assume now the funds are to be used to purchase items within our own capacity. That was a question. Um, okay, yeah, that was just to fill back in. Uh, if we can also, like for Alan, we can, the SS can also help with that as well, to, to take that on if it's easier for the, so the student doesn't have to spend a thousand dollars on their own. Um, I can also jump in and talk about Warren, with Warren's comment about maybe why Red Cross might not be a good option for directly supporting. Um, we've had this, I, I believe the, 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 the multi-party group um, have been talking about different organizations uh, for financial donation to. And one of the reasons why we've not suggested the Red Cross is what we find is they don't always, they tend to focus on just the larger areas. And there's a lot of smaller groups that need special reservations that tend to not get, just kind of get ignored. Um, and so I can't give a lot more detail on it because I've only been to the one, one meeting at the first, but then Jess and Matt have taken over. And I think they can give more feedback as to why. The reason why they also, the Red Cross has like an agreement with, with the province for like major uh, disaster relief. That's also why they have the matching agreements and such. Um, so we're, we're happy for people that want to submit, like want to financially donate to Red Cross. So just from an organization, I think we, we were thinking about SFU and others were thinking of targeting um, other groups that tend to get missed by the larger donation drives. Okay, was there anything um, anything else that anyone wanted to talk about on this item? Tiana had a question in chat. Um, so yeah, BSS, BSU is on board with wanting to donate. A question that was quite is this, how will the donation be distributed? Will there be people driving them out to flood victims? Um, I will get back to you on that, uh, on the logistics, because that's something Matt and, and Jess have been working with uh, the different groups on. Um, my So I, and I can't give you an answer right now, but we can, we'll definitely get that back. We'll get, I'll pass it on to them. Right. Uh, going back to Nahash's question, sorry, just to make sure the SOS can purchase items or is on the student units groups to do so. Uh, no, I think both can be happening. I think it's just the reason why we're allowing also student units to, to purchase themselves is maybe it's a little bit more faster with lots of different small groups doing purchases as opposed to they all funneling to the SOS and then we are doing ourselves. So. Uh, I think it just allows for more flexibility. But if you, again, if your student union needs, prefers to have the SOS do the purchase on your behalf with your core, just let us know as well. Any other discussion on this item? All right, Corbett, just before I move on, was there anything else? Um, not that I know of, no, thank you. Okay. Okay. So the next item is 9.2, Red Bull proposal. Corbett, go ahead. Okay, thank you. So I am gonna share my screen on this. Uh, give me a minute to get this all set up. Mm. 
Sorry, I'm, I'm so used to, to other software. Mm. Where it starts. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, both this motion and oh, sorry, this discussion and the next discussion uh, relate to the S the sub gaming lounge. Um, we initially were this has kind of been on and off talks for a while with me and John and also with support from um, the SFU Esports Association. They they actually brought some people to us first, like uh, Memory Express and, and initial contacts with Red Bull, but uh, we've taken on that discussion over the fall. Um, so uh, Red Bull has, uh, yeah, me and John have been going back and forth with Red Bull, um, talking about what type of information we'd need for council to make a decision on, on uh, sorry, I'm kind of getting ahead. Red Bull would like to partner with us uh, related to our gaming lounge, uh, to what they would call the Red Bull Gaming Lab, um, as they are, have a program where they are supporting different uh, university gaming la lounges or labs um, to support esports. Um, and so what they're offering is to spend money to renovate the space, to brand it to their, their, their style, um, and to help make the space feel unique um, and welcoming uh, for, for specific types of events um, and activities. So we've been going back and forth about what they would offer us uh, at, in this SFS and for our members. Um, and this is their initial uh, proposal. And I wanted to bring this to uh, council so that you have an idea of what's kind of been discussed and what options we have available. Yes. Um, sorry, one second. Also, they wanted to make sure that you understand that these photos are just either existing spaces, but not necessarily what might look like in the sub. We, we'd have to have further discussions on that, but they kind of want to give you generally what, what current spaces look like, what they've, they've done for current spaces. Okay. And also they were not able to be here today, so that's why I'm presenting <laughs> instead of them. Uh, but we can definitely, uh, we can definitely um, have this discussion. And if there's any questions or concerns or, or anything, uh, we can bring it back and I, we can pass, I can pass it on to uh, the group, or oh, sorry, to Red Bull. So um, Red Bull has a number of, they, they, have a, they have quite a bit of infrastructure supporting these types of events. As, as you're not surprised, energy drinks are well ingrained into lots of different sports activities not, and esports being a big one. Um, there's other competitors, which you can probably all guess which they would be, but Red Bull is one that we've been talking to. Um, so they have, uh, so the, the, so the, the quick SPACs is like a field team to Vancouver and available to help support. Um, uh, everyone knows what Red Bull is. It's a well known energy drink in the, in the environment. Um, and they've been working a lot with esports for the last decade. Uh, I don't want to go too much as, as uh, me selling Red Bull to you because I'm not Red Bull, right? But uh, I do want to kind of go through the slides. Um, but they do have a number of uh, some interesting uh, additional support programs for like teaching, uh, having students support around if you want to get into like casting or um, marketing or coaching and, and other areas within the esports environment. Um, Excuse me, so getting used to this. But, oops. Yeah. So, this is our objective with us collaborate with a student site to develop a premium multi use gaming space on campus for our, for our members, uh, bring the world of Red Bull to life on campus, and ensuring longevity through continuous support of SFU Esports Association Club members and events. So, they basically, want to have a, help us improve our space to allow for more events and to be able to support the SFU Esports um, Association with events and such. So the overview, 
is the the actual they want to well one they would like us to they'd like to brand it as the Red Bull Gaming Lab. Um, they're like to a value in kind uh, build contribution, so 50k to renovate the space to upgrade the lounge, and that renovations could be things like the neon signs, the, the LED strip strips, um, maybe like changing the floor or wall space or colors and all that such stuff. Um, adding their branded items like Red Bull fridges and tables in the space, um, being able to give out Red Bull or add Red Bull to uh, events on, on campus. Um, they would like a, a five-year term agreement with a six-year, would be able to extend it, and a rights of a first refusal. They would also like to contribute uh, just almost $13,000 to the SFU Esports um, Association, about 2.5K a year for five years uh, to support their events and activities. Um, and of course, spread out their, their, their product and be able to have Red Bull branded events to utilize the space. This is an example of what they've had in Ryerson. Uh, they were this one they were talking to us about quite a bit. That's a, a relatively new space. They I think it's a space they've been working with. Um, and so here's some photos, or at least it's a mock-up. I think uh, yeah, it's a mock-up of sorry, not photos. It's a mock-up of what they're going to be doing with Ryerson because they're also in the in the process of making the space over in Toronto. Uh, other just pose generally a large setup will be different uh, because we have different rooms and different, uh, um, you know, we have spaces dedicated for console gaming stuff, not just uh, esports directly and desktop, but desktops. But having dedicated fridge and space for Red Bull and such. And that's really just like this really basic um, idea we could have a discussion on this if there's some general interest in going forward we can I can amend the agenda to do a, a approval sorry it's a motion to approve in principle basically saying you as as overseas of, of the society would like us to continue me and John and others to continue forward all right um Abby you can go ahead yeah I wanted to say um Previous SFSS boards have worked with Red Bull before. For example, we had the Red Bull Carnival, and honestly, that went really, really well. It looked like all the students were having a good time. I got a bunch of free Red Bull, and there was a bunch of fun events. Um, honestly, this this is just looking a gift horse in the mouth. They're giving us a bunch of money to do renovations for us. I, I think it, it would be extremely foolish to turn this down. And on top of that, students get opportunities in areas like marketing and esports. Th this only seems like a win to me. Thank you. Thanks, Abby. Shashank? Yeah, uh, a couple of questions, actually. This is, first of all, before I ask my question, it's a really good initiative. Uh, Red Bull's been partnering with a lot of esports clubs and events from a while ago. And just that previously, they never gave us permission to use their logo directly in events. Now it's it's really good they're actually letting us do that because having a Red Bull logo in something is super cool in terms of gamers. But uh for the questions i want to know since so they're technically giving us like let's say two thousand five hundred dollars per uh year in our five-year contract that will basically cover up to like let's say one to two gaming pcs at most if we're planning on uh getting further gaming pcs now what does is the actual renovation for the gaming lounge is that still dependent on the sfss's money and red bull is not directly contributing towards that so you're, sorry, just to double check, you mean the, the question is basically the equipment, the gaming equipment in the lounge? Uh, right now, the gaming lounge uh, is technically empty-ish. Now, to renovate that, to like actually turn it into this, is Red Bull going to be providing anything to turn it into this? Are they going to be contributing the money? or is uh, that they're, they're contributing up to $50,000 to renovate the space. And this is on top of the 2.5K per Yes. Year. That, okay. that 2.5 is specifically for the Esports Association to support their events and programming. Okay, fantastic. Thanks. Okay. Kashish, you can go ahead next. Kashish? Uh, 
Are you there? All right, well, maybe we will go to Devin. Yeah, I had, uh, I just wanted to make everyone aware of something and we can maybe have a bigger discussion about this, but um, I do remember that Red Bull did have a controversy in 2020 in which top execs were fired for, for having racist slides in a presentation. And so I just wanted to make sure that everyone was aware of it. It does seem that they have uh, fired those exec at their top three executives that were using a, a racist, I believe it was MAP. Um, in their slides, but I just think as an SFSS that stands for equity and anti-racism, these are things we should be aware of before partnering with a company like Red Bull. Um, so maybe that's something we can do a little more research on. I can't say I know all the details of it. Um, my other question was, so if Red Bull gives us 50k, I'm sort of aware of how expensive gaming computers are and they're very expensive so I was curious what other um what we have in the budget to supplement that uh 50k because we could easily spend 50k on like four computers <laughs> sure I can go that's actually interesting enough that's actually part of the second discussion item is the equipment so this is just there's 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 two actually in a way I probably should have merged them together but there was two separate presentations so or two separate documents so um, in hindsight, I probably should have merged it also. We can explain all of it. But the equipment is being covered, the potential equipment costs are being covered in our next discussion item with memory expressed. So this is primarily Red Bull just wants to do this. Because originally we, we had an initial discussion with memory express and original agreement um, that got delayed because then we involved Red Bull and that had changed um, some dynam dynamics and some are talking about like branding and such. So thanks, Corbett. Uh, Chloe? Yeah, I was just going to add that, um, like, with one of the biggest complaints from our membership being, like, a lack of, lack of, like, student life and events on campus, like, I think that, um, like, furnishing this game room and having a really nice game room, um, will, like, provide a big improvement for students, um, and yeah, also just, like, all the other conversations we've been having today about future events makes me really excited for, for the future of, um, SFS or SFU like student life. Thanks, Chloe. Zaid? Um, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, as I said in the chat, I was wondering, have we spoken to any other energy drink companies to see if they have anything different to offer? Um, I know Monster is probably Red Bull's largest competitor, and we could try and um, maybe see what both of them offer, maybe play the offers off of each other, uh, just to make sure that we get the best deal. And also um, something to keep in consideration is if we go forward with this, um, to kind of look at what kind of changes they would be making that may or may not be disruptive in the sub, um, whether that's like ostent ostentatious like signage or um, things like that, we'd probably have to set some kind of um, I guess, like ground rules in any agreement we enter into with them. Okay, thank you. Uh, for to answer your first question about, uh, say, Monster or others, no, we haven't has spoke to them yet. This was um, our connection to Red Bull was uh, facilitated through um, SFE Esports Association. Um, and so we've just been speaking with them primarily uh, for, the, for this aspect of the space. Thanks, Corbett. Jeremy, you're up next. Yeah, I just wanted to speak in support of this. Um, Red Bull has had a lot of sponsorships with IAD in the past, as well as I think the person that probably put this through at SFU Esports um, is an IAD student. Um, and all of the sponsorships that we've had with them have been super positive, and which is also why I assume that Esports has been continuing those sponsorships with them, um, which is why SFU Esports also did put this forward and is probably leaning in towards it because of a positive history. Thank you. Um, Mahindra. Um, so I wanted to speak about uh, the monetary perspective of this. Uh, uh, $50,000 uh, in terms of equipment up for a, a more, approximately five years of uh, 
commitment or contract. Uh, so basically 10, 12,500 a year uh, for advertisement. I'm not sure if that amount is uh, enough to uh, justify the advertisement they will be getting out of it, or I'm not sure what the standards are, but um, how, how did we come up with this amount? Did they just tell us or there was negotiations? Uh, another thing would be the slide deck said it will be SFU Red Bull Gaming Lounge. So are, like, are the naming rights with SFU or with SFSS? I'm a bit confused about that. Thank you. Sure, I can answer. So um, for the last question, uh, we can get that changed. I, it's an issue we've, I've always found with, with groups that don't understand the difference between the student union and or the student society and the university. And so we'll have, we can go back and say, no, it, I won't necessarily be, we probably shouldn't have SFU in the name of that, uh, either SOS or just no, no SFU or SOS language in front of it. Um, Sorry, can you say the the, second, the first question again? So yeah, basically like how did we come up with the number? Do we know what the competition or anyone else would offer for the same space? Okay, yeah, that was, uh, we were going back and forth with me and John um, on costs and such. And we kind of, I think we basically estimated based on size of space, the type of things they would generally be putting in as to the cost of the space, like to renovate the space. Also working with SFU's contractors, which tend to be a bit more expensive. Um, sometimes uh, it really varies. Um, and I think that was what they pitched as a reasonable amount. Or how awesome. much they would like to contribute. Awesome, thank you. Uh, just to add one more thing. For the gaming lounge, like mm -hmm. uh, would we consider a rental model as well or uh, we want to just allocate it to a company? I'm not sure about that. <laughs> No, it'd still be an SFS controlled space. Um, part of the agreement would allow them to have S um, Red Bull um, specific events. Um, I would want us to put in some kind of, like as part of the final agreement, some kind of restriction on like how much that would be. I believe when they're talking about this, there's specific events they do every year um, across Canada. So like, it has some, there's things to do with like, they, they fly people out for, uh, a specific uh, a major event that they have in Canada or, or for like um, teams competing across Canada. Uh, and I, I wish, I'm sorry, I don't know enough about esports specific to know which, which events these are. Um, and I think we'll get more information from that from Red Bull. Um, uh, so as for like renting space out, we could do that as part of like a monetization of the sub. Um, to have if we wanted you know specific groups to come in but it really depends it's not a super large space it's more it still was originally designed more like a rec room with some casual gaming drop-in gaming so the, our direction of going this with more supporting esports is a little bit um it's a bit different direction but there still allows for more than just esports gaming uh other types of games can be played um and, and potentially other kinds of activities but um this is more, this could be also be, the room could be used for training and such. I don't know about monetization, how effective it would be at the moment, but it's something we can look into. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, Almas asked in the chat, when will the lounge be ready by? It's a good question, uh, especially with the flooding and stuff that's really affecting supply lines for a lot of things. Um, and because a lot, some roads are blocked off or, or uh, washed out. Um, so it ultimately kind of depends on what ends up being put into the space and what can be like done locally or if there's stuff that has to be shipped in. Uh, like for instance, millwork is almost always a custom millwork, like desk and stuff is always uh, a challenge. We already have tables, we already have the couches. It's just more things like if they want to do like redo the flooring, redo the walls and stuff, some things will be easier, some things will take longer. It's, it's hard to predict right now because we actually don't have a final like this is all the stuff that we want to put into it. And Shashank, you can go ahead. Wait, thanks. Um, one thing I wanted to say is that as much as I appreciate Red Bull taking care of all the furnishing and making it look super sassy, as do we have any say in the actual design of it? Because as much as I like the gamer vibes, I don't want Red Bull's logo to be on every single wall like eight times. 
Um, going from conversations, I think we'd have some say on that. Like, they, because ultimately they would be coming back with their actual mock-ups and stuff, and as part of the formal agreement. Uh, like, I would prefer that. I would require that. Um, that we come later, and so if we don't like it, we can give feedback on that as well. Perfect. Uh, one more question is the actual use of the room. Now, we know that this is an esports room and yeah. the access to the club or the booking of the club, will that be very similar to how booking of other rooms are being done right now? Like for example, the esports has to book to use it instead of just having access to it and letting the general public use it all the other times. As far as I understand, uh, the, so the, still the goal for the space is to allow for drop-in times um, and allow students to come in but also be able to book it from time to time for specific types of events or and or specific types of like training sessions and such. Fantastic. So, so the it, same it's model not as... purely just for esports. Again, like there's going to be some support to it, but there would also be like like console gaming and such as well in the space. All right. Perfect. Thank you. All right. There's no one left on the speakers list. Um... Corbett, any final thoughts from you? Uh, no, just uh, if you're, if there is any concerns uh, or things you want us to go forward with, um, please send an email or, or actually do let people feel comfortable at least to continue this next process with doing like a motion to prove it in principle. Or should I do wait until we do the second mo second discussion and then maybe do a, a full motion for both? Why don't we do that? Okay. Do you want to go ahead then? We'll move on to 9.3, which is Memory Express proposal. Yeah, sure. Give me a minute to bring that up. Um, Okay. Everyone can, I hope everyone can see that. Yep. Okay. So this is just more of a, uh, this is a bit more of a history on this. Um, we actually, the SFS actually, the board last year, um, okay, sorry. Um, we are, some history that, yeah, so originally, uh, first contact about supplying the gaming lounge before even thinking about like renovating the, the, the look and stuff was with Memory Express and the last year's boards. Again, this was coming through uh, connections through SFE Sports Association. Um, and they were interested in having a two year agreement with us to of, for zero cost lease of uh, uh, computers. Um, I think we would pay for repairs and, and replacement on such, but we wouldn't have to buy the computers at all um, uh, for the space, which would save us was going to save us like about almost thirty thousand um, dollars. They were mid-range computers because we we weren't sure how the space would be used, and so we didn't want us to go in with a really massive, um, super powerful gaming computer, especially because computing computers go get become obsolete very quickly. Um, and so we the board approved in principle. Uh, proposal and then we were waiting for a final one but there was some delays on that because uh, we were still working on the, the MOU with SFU Esports and then we were working with um, uh, there was just a, there was a number of different delays um, and so because now we've we've now and then also we started talking with Rebel and there was different ideas on like who would be speaking with who and such um, uh, and we have not come to like having two separate agreements have one separate one. Um, and American Express is still interested in working with us, but we've changed it to like a one year uh, agreement because we think the computer, there were the same computer, same uh, stats and stuff. So after a year, they would be either way, if we improved the thing last year and it's not going, we'd still have to have the computers replaced around the same time anyways. So we just shortened it from a two year to one year. Um, if we like what's going on and we like working with Memory Express and, and everything's going well in the space, then we can also have an extension for a two year lease. Um, so what they're asking for is, are asking to give us a 16 full desktop PC sets with monitors, for peripherals, network hardware, and like Windows 10 and 
um, with a warranty um, for full additional full setups remain at, from Emory Express. So basically, if we have a computer die on us or we need to swap with some parts, they've got four fully functional computers that they can swap out quickly. Um, support them for on-site services and such. Um, what we'd like they like us to cover is about twelve hundred dollars in shipping fees, fishing, shipping and handling uh, for the twenty computers. Um, some naming rights in the lounge um, and Academy uh, desktop shortcuts. Um, so that's a support. Um, they're also working with various partner brands for the, a lot of the peripherals and, and tech. So like Intel, Corsair, NSI, NVIDIA, and Microsoft. And they like to do some special events uh, for with Memory Express. Same, similar kind of requests as um, Red Bull and, and access the space to, to, to a certain extent. And some vinyl decals, decals on the main wall. So the, the, the brand new stuff where we're gonna have to work with both groups to try to sort this all out. Um, obviously, the, if they both wanna name the gaming lounge, it's gonna be a hard, it's gonna be a difficulty, uh, but that's something we do in behind the scenes and then come back with a formal stuff. Um, so this is some of the current pictures of the space. Uh, you know, we have, we have tables that we have, the two monitors are for like gaming, console gaming. Um, and the tables in the back row are currently kind of in seven pods for teams of, of five. Um, and there's, there's basically five computers sorry, five, uh, three pods of teams of five, so 15 computers, then an additional computer for a standalone, I think for like some operational stuff or just having an individual game. That's not necessarily team-based. So it's really, that's really it. It's really basic. It, it's, ba it's basically, the idea fundamentally is Red Bull, if we go with them, will renovate the space and contribute to the Esports Association and Memory Express provides the equipment. So that will save us, you know, about, yeah up to $40,000 or so if we go with that. Yeah, the, I'm not gonna comment on that, but this, this was, so yeah, that's, that's really about it. All right, thanks Corbett. Questions or comments? Um, Devin, you're first up. Yeah, sorry for having so many questions today, but um, regarding um, I, Memory Express um, providing computers, in terms of like consoles, would be that be something that then the SFSS would have to pay for individually? Like if we got some Xboxes, PS5s, and some specific like a Nintendo Switches, so we could have like Mario Kart parties and stuff like that? Uh yeah, we would have to be paying for it. We've already purchased some consoles, but this was, I think, like PS3s or, or Xboxes or PS4, but Xbox, like they're out of date now. Uh, but this was also because they expected the sub to be open much sooner than it is. Um, and so we would have to purchase the, the console stuff. Uh, and yeah, honestly, I'm happy to get ideas on what to buy. Um, not just for the standard, you know, the best PS5s and whatever the best, best Xbox or other consoles are. Um, but also to get for like switches and other types of peripherals that make sense. As for tasking and stuff, yeah, Sega Genesis. Just I'm just to be clear, Shashank, I'm old enough to actually have played on the Sega Genesis, the original. So <laughs> um, I don't even know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> um, so as for Zay's question, who are we tasking with finding a PS5? John will handle like the equipment. We just need to give him a list of things to buy and pass probably pass some money on that. All right, Shashank. All right, hi. Again, I also would like to apologize for the number of questions. This is a very interesting topic. But uh, do Red Bull and Memory Express know that we're talking to both of them? Yes, they do. Originally, it was Memory Express was going to be the one that worked on it like a full final package, but um, after meeting with, with Red Bull directly, they prefer to have it separately. And then we kind of sort out the 
fine details between those agreements. And by fine details, do you specifically mean like the the specs of the computers? Uh, fine details more in the sense of like branding and and other potential areas of conflict in the two agreements. Okay, and do we have any say with respect to the specs of the computers? They've provided like, us the specs. Um, I, sorry, I, I thought it was, there was in the document, but it's I can give I can share it with council the the current specs for the computers that they've offered. Fantastic. And are we allowed to get like equivalent specs of different companies, for example, Intel to AMD and stuff like that? Is that open to the discussion still? We could if we don't want to go with Memory Express. Basically, if we want to go on our own. Never mind. Okay, perfect. Because Memory Express has their own built computer sets. Oh, I see. I see. I see. Okay. Like it's it's yeah they 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 got the, they have they're basically building have these built Memory Express branded computers. Um, that All right. Are, that's sense. part of the deal. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, ben, go ahead. So I have a similar question. Just looking at the product loan agreement that was sent, is is this a current document? Or was this from a while oh, ago? Oh, yes. Thank you. There was a second document. My apologies. Uh... One second, I'll try to grab it and share it because I think that would help. Yeah, so I will. Um, share my screen. So everyone can see this. Yep. So this is what they're they are recommending. They're not super high, they're, they're kind of mid-range, and the reason being that we're gonna to have to change it anyways, relatively soon, I think. So the, this one year agreement is basically a, kind of like a pilot project in many ways. Ben, go ahead. Yeah, my question on the age of the document was more just I was looking at the CPU they're suggesting, and it seems like this was drafted like two years ago or something. Because this was started two years ago, and that's kind of like why it's it is what it is. Like I said originally we were going to have a two year lease, and but because it took it, we were delayed by a year. It's it's the same situation. It's just that's why I shrunk it down to one year lease. Because either way, we'd have to have upgrade this at the end. All right, well, there's no one else on the speakers list. Um, Corbett, did you want to add any final thoughts? Yeah, uh, my final thoughts are basically, this is like the agreement we've had brought to us. Um, and if people are uh, fine with going, uh, excuse me, my apologies, one second. If people are comfortable with us proven in principle or if not um or if there's more questions that you'd like us to bring get to bring back to the groups because unfortunately like john's not here to also talk about these things because he was doing a lot of the initial discussion between the groups when i wasn't able to attend and you can email me questions yeah So I think maybe we could pose the question, you can pose the question like this, Corbett. Would anyone be like passionately in opposition to considering this as a motion at today's meeting? Or would you like to consider this as a motion in January after having time to speak with your student unions? Ben, you're on the speaker's list. Uh, I'd prefer if we wait until January to consider this. Okay. Okay. We can also, yeah, because as one said, DSSS and I'm sending active right now. Okay. Um, we can definitely do that. We can, um, you know, give feedback from council about the what, what was discussed at this meeting, and also send me email questions. Um, I can. I'll look into the working group questions that was brought up in chat. Um, 
uh, and go from there. Okay, that's all then. Cool, cool. So that concludes discussion items. We have section 10 of the agenda, which is notices of motion. And we have two notices of motion. The first one is steps forward. This was submitted by Corbett. And this motion that we will be considering at the next meeting of council is as follows. Um, be it resolved that council approve adding the following sentence to finance policy one, student society fees, uh, exempt exemptions and renumber the policy accordingly. That students only enrolled in auditing courses, um, notwithstanding the above, students through SFU's inclusive post-secondary education partnership with steps forward, students will be charged student society fees. And we also have 10.2, concurrent studies. This was also submitted by Corbett. This will be voted on at the, considered at the next meeting of council. And the motion is as follows. Be it resolved that council approve adding the following sentence to finance policy one, student society fees exemptions and renumber the policy accordingly. Um, that um, concurrent studies students are exempt from all student society fees. Um, and be it further resolved that council approve amending finance policy 1.14 with the following, um, that students enrolled in the concurrent, students enrolled in the concurrent studies program and be it further resolved that council approve amending FP 115 with the following, students enrolled in the concurrent studies program. So both those notices of motion will be voted on at the meeting in January. And that takes us to section 11, which is 30 minute Q&A. Are there any questions from um, SFSS members? If there are, are any in attendance? Okay, we'll move on then to adjournment. And that's a good question, Shashank. So Shashank asks when the next meeting will be. Unless we need to call an emergency meeting for any particular motion that comes up, we're trying our hardest not to call another meeting for December um, because of exams and to give people a break over the holidays. So if we stick to that plan, um, which I hope we can, the first meeting of council in January, okay, everyone write this down, and I'll also send out calendar invites shortly, the first meeting of council in January will be on the 19th, Wednesday, January 19th. All right. Will there be a dev session in the meantime? So between now and January 19th, no, we aren't having any development sessions. So Wednesday <laughs> evenings are free <laughs> for a while for, for everyone. Okay. So adjournment, be it resolved to adjourn the meeting at 7.49 p.m. Is there a mover? Shashank. Shashank, is there a seconder? Political science. Yeah. Political science seconds. All right, all those in favor of adjourning the meeting, seeking unanimous consent. All right, this motion is carried unanimously.